Sergeant Shaw, please join us. <coughs> Morning, Madam Chair and Committee. Uh, hey, well, so uh, thank you for uh, asking us in today, and we appreciate uh, the chance to testify before you in, in this committee. Uh, I'm here today representing the County, Rowland County delegation, and as seen on the screen, uh, I did submit a letter to your committee uh, in the early part of April concerning the uh, slate industry in, in uh, southwestern Rowland County and the value that that industry has toward the economic output of, of the county and the state. Uh, there are folks here, and you may or may not hear from all of them today, uh, from the various towns, represent, representing, officially representing the towns who can talk to you about the economic impact. Uh, we understand that the committee has some concerns uh, with the slate industry, and we, we also, the county delegation also understands that there's uh, I'm hoping that we can come to some sort of a, uh, an agreement amongst the committee and, and the industry that uh, accomplishes the goals of the committee, but yet uh, takes into consideration the, uh, uh, the industry and the folks in, in that family, basically a family-owned industry uh, uh, in, in Vermont that is actually has a worldwide impact. Uh, the, everybody's talked about a grandfather clause. I think maybe, maybe we should... I don't want to talk about that today, uh, but I think there's a way to talk about that. Uh, and my letter uh, gives you several bullet points, and Madam Chair, I won't take up a lot of your time today because uh, I think it's more important that you hear from the groups of folks that are here. But uh, the last paragraph of the letter, uh, and I think, you know, we'll scroll down to that, I think would be helpful if uh, the committee would consider setting up an off-session working group uh, with, with a legislator from the area, uh, somebody, obviously somebody from your committee, and, whom, and that representatives from the industry to come to some sort of an agreement of what, what's doable, possible, and acceptable to everybody uh, in this conversation. And I understand that uh, you may not get the bill out this year. So that might be helpful to be able to do. I don't know the mechanics of doing a, a working group uh, without having legislation to form it, but that's why you're the chair and I'm sitting on this end of the table. So. Well, I think I also just heard you volunteer for summer work. Uh, I, I, you know what, I do have a volunteer for that uh, from that district. <laughs> oh, all right. <laughs> uh, his, his name might be Representative Helm. <laughs> But I would be helpful, uh, glad to do whatever uh, I would be assigned to do, should I, should I be involved in that. Right, so I think for, the, um, for you and also our guests, I would just say that what the committee has decided to do is to ask the NRB to convene that conversation. And um, it's great to know that you support that effort to kind of work over the summer to come to some resolution mm -hmm. um, and we support it too so thank we're going to be asking the NRB to do that take the lead and coordinate. thank you and I think you'll hear a little bit from the folks today about their concerns I have a, I have a concern personally about what is a dormant quarry and what does it mean to be yeah. dormant uh, why is it dormant uh, you may or may not have heard this before uh, what type of regulations are necessary what type of regulations do we have currently in place and for me, what, what is a quarry hole? And what, what constitutes a quarry hole? Uh, and I think that's an important question that maybe the working group will have to delve into uh, over the summer. But also in my, some of my conversations that we've had around the, around the building and, and with these folks is I think there's some education to do uh, amongst the, uh, uh, how do I say this? No, I can't say it, can't say it, can't. Uh, among the people selling real estate, that they understand what the responsibilities are to themselves uh, and know what a dormant quarry is and what, are the, what can happen, what could happen with a dormant quarry if you're selling a piece of property next to it. And I, and I also understand that uh, title searches typically only go back 40 years. Some of these quarries have been dormant, or not used, I won't call them dormant, not used for, for over 40 years. So that's something that maybe working groups could also address. Mm -hmm. So with that, Madam Chair, I will go do a land swap in my committee this morning, and thank you for having me in. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. Yep. Thank you.
Thanks. We need a new air handling system. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, we are Thanks right. for making that. Wait, could you come back? We're going to we want to see engineering studio. <laughs> yeah. Have, have you actually talked to, uh, to uh, the air handling guy at DJS? Yeah. 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 Yesterday. Oh, yeah. 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 Good. We're, we're going to um, circle back with you all. Yeah. Good. Good. We look forward. Good. Look forward to that. Yeah. <laughs> Legislative speaker, come on in. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, great. We have Chris Smith up next. And we have two of you on. We're going to give you the full half an hour, and then we had a request from one other to speak. So keeping Absolutely. in mind that we have 15, 25 more minutes. Understood. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee, for the opportunity to address you today. Uh, my name is Chris Smid. I work at New England Slate in Pulteney, Vermont. And I speak this morning on behalf of many of the slate producers in western Ralton County. Slate's, uh, as you know, Slate's played a tremendous role in the social and economic history of our region. The industry uh, employed thousands and thousands of people during the late 1800s and early 1900s, drawing immigrants from across Europe. Today, between 300 and 400 people work directly with the Slate industry, and with few exceptions, we are small family-run operations. We're not huge multinational corporations. The industry generates an estimated $40 million a year in sales. Almost all of that comes from outside the state of Vermont, so we're bringing in fresh dollars into the Vermont economy. Um, Vermont produces some of the highest quality slate in the world in a unique range of natural colors. It is a 100% all natural real stone. It's still split one piece at a time by hand by hard working, independent minded folks. Uh, roofing slate lasts over 100 years, a stark contrast to asphalt shingles or synthetic slates made from petroleum products, which end up in the landfill after 25 or 30 years. So, in many ways, it's a very, very green product. Um, we're currently doing a job in New Hampshire right now where the original slate was installed in 1876. It's being removed because the nail is rusted, and 80% of the slate is still usable after that, that lifespan. So it's a very long life, very natural product. Um, can be used for flooring and wall cladding, structural pieces and more. So just like maple syrup and Ben and & Jerry's, uh, Vermont is known for its world-class, all-natural, handcrafted slate and stone products. It's something we can all be proud of. The Slate Valley runs just over 20 miles from Castleton in the north to West Paulette in the south. It's only a mile or two wide. It's a very limited geographic extent. Uh, there are three to 400 quarry holes on more than 100 parcels that were registered with the District 1 office in the 1990s, as you're aware. Um, this registration allowed quarries that were in existence prior to Act 250 to continue operating or to be held in reserve for future operations. Families and businesses have invested in these mineral assets. In many cases, quarries are considered a retirement plan, a nest egg, an inheritance that gets passed down from generation to generation. So members of the slate production community uh, feel that changes to Act 250 that are in the proposed draft legislation uh, would be severely detrimental to our business, to our industry, our local economy, and our communities. Recently, the announced closing of Green Mountain College in Pulteney spurred a series of public meetings about the economic future of Western Rowland County. Rightfully, much of, this, of the discussion focused on bringing new jobs, new economic drivers to the region. I suggest that we should also be looking at ways to protect and develop the few industries we already have. The working landscape of farming, forestry, and stone products is a critical part of our state, and it should not be regulated out of existence. Attracting remote workers is certainly a worthy goal, but Vermont needs a diverse economy to support its future health. Changes to Act 250's treatment of the slate industry may be appropriate, but they should be thoughtful and deliberate. There's our collective challenge to find that critical balance of economic and environmental consideration. To that end, my colleagues and I were discouraged by some of the language uh, taken in the draft legislation, but were very encouraged by the draft letter of April 5th requesting the formation of a stakeholder group. We welcome the opportunity to address the common goals of the region with a local process. We are optimistic of the concerns of neighbors can be addressed while still supporting the small businesses that form the fabric of our communities. While change is difficult, the proposed process and the proposed process is unfamiliar, we are hopeful the stakeholder group approach will yield the best possible results for all the parties involved. In closing, I'd like to thank members of this committee, the entire Rutland County delegation, the representatives from the towns and municipalities around us uh, for all the work on this issue. And uh, we are encouraged by the support of that, of that draft proposal to. Uh, to create a working group and uh, update Act 250 for the slave industry. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. What's the appraised value of a quarry held in reserve? Uh, it depends on uh, 
what type of slate is in that quarry and the access and many other things. So it's hard to tell. It's a, it's a difficult asset to uh, um, appraise. If I wanted to come to grips with the economic loss, what, mm -hmm. what happened in the event that you lost this exemption, what would I, what would I consider the, that quarry and reserve to be worth? So there, um, that's a really good question. There could be some geologic testing that could be done to assess the in-ground mineral assets. Mm -hmm. um, well, the, I'm just kind of looking for yeah. a ballpark figure. If you, if it yeah, I, it could be it could be hundreds of thousands of dollars, um, perhaps more. So it, it depends on the location, the size of the parcel, the the type of slate that's in there. But hundreds, thousands, upwards. I guess I would just add that you know permits don't mean that you're not operating. Sure. Right. So permit means you're allowed to do what you're doing, but there's a conversation about how it gets done along the way. So I think. Thank you. That's yes. just a reminder that it doesn't. You know. Increasing whatever, changing it won't shut it down. Understood. Thank you for that. Uh, uh, we agree. I think some of the uh, concern is about the uncertainty of that permit process and what the stipulations would be. So I think the working group is a great way to have that conversation and perhaps allay some of those fears. Great. And we're, we share the interest in consistency and predictability. Uh, Representative Odie. Um, how many square miles did you say that all the quarries have? The valley runs about 20 miles north to south and might be roughly two miles wide. So, um, you know, yeah, one to two miles. It, it, <laughs> very, it, it meanders. There's the vein of slate is a very discrete geologic formation. So in some, some areas it bows out, in some areas it pinches in. So, you know, two times 20, 40 square miles would be a, a rough estimation. Thank you. Right. Would you just tell the two, the two uh, towns on each end? Castleton yes. in the north. Uh, some would argue Hubberton is the very northern end of the slate, but for most practical purposes, uh, Castleton in the north on Lake Bombazine down to West Paulette in the south. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Um, next up, we have Craig McCraw. Oh, we heard from Craig before. Craig. Yep. Okay. Thank you. So I, I welcome back. Thank you. I just uh, don't have much to add to. You could to just the, say your name. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm not sure. Sorry, Craig Markro from Vermont Structural Slate. Uh, I don't have a whole lot to add to the PowerPoint presentation that I gave a few weeks ago, uh, but wanted to respond to the letter that I saw um, discussing or proposing the, uh, the study period and the study committee, and just wanted to to uh, respond to that letter um, today and say that we think it's a good idea. We're always happy to, to uh, discuss our industry and show people what we do. And we look forward to that dialogue and, and uh, we think it's a good idea. Um, I, I do want to thank, uh, on behalf of the industry, the, the uh, Rutland County delegation for its support and its letter and also uh, the Slate Valley uh, town officials and, and select boards for its support. And uh, we actually have uh, letters of support from e e each, each and every town in the Slate Valley, which I'd like to submit today for the, for the record. And, and can I ask the, uh, the uh, town officials and the, any Rutland County people are here to stand up just so you can see? I'm not sure who's here. Yeah, I'm Hal Wilkins. I represent Paulette. Okay. West Paulette. I'm Terry Williams. I represent Paulette. Mm -hmm. Frank Nelson. My ancestors were potato farmers in the area and stumbled onto slate and got into the slate business many, many generations ago. And uh, the planning commission uh, was started by my father. What town are you from? West Paulette and Paulette. Thank you. Started by my father and the <coughs> 1960s, with a foresight to have sensible planning, they set up an industrial zone with the slate quarries being in the industrial zone with the intent of everybody knowing about this and that the slate industry was going to be operating as it was. Uh, other industries as well, right, but they moved into that area. And uh, so this hasn't been, and this was went through various planning revisions as well as unified bylaws without any opposition from any resident during any of those processes well over 50 years now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. 
I'm Joe Gunter. I'm the town manager out of Fairhaven. Fairhaven? Fairhaven. Great. Great. Mike Jones, the uh, town manager in Castle. All right. So, you know, don't have much more to say other than we look forward to the process and and uh, um, I, I have a question. We'll, we'll, how will the makeup of that committee be determined? Um, well, it's uh, as yet to be determined, I think, specifically. So if you have input, now's the time to share it with us. Okay. I don't have any input. I'm just curious how it, how it would be. I mean, it would, I guess, obviously, it would be some quarry representation, mm -hmm. neighbor representation, mm -hmm. town representation. And then the NRB will be convening at NRB. Natural Resources Board. Okay. So people directly involved with, with yes. the issue. Yep. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, oh, and then we have the gentleman who requested to be at it. Uh, my name is Richard Hill, and uh, I'm from Greenstone Slate. Uh, I also own a slate quarry individually, Richard Hill, in uh, New York State. Uh, I would like first to point out that I'm very much in favor of a working group. Uh, I think there's a lot of misinformation uh, that, it, that's been presented uh, you know, by various witnesses, and I think that. Uh, um, um, working with the group, getting together, um, actually looking at the ground would uh, certainly uh, take away a lot of the, the, the misunderstanding that's there. I would like to make one little point, it's kind of off the subject, but it was brought up in the last hearing by a couple witnesses about uh, New York state laws. Uh, my quarries and my one quarry in New York uh, is subject to uh, an overall uh, an overall um, regulation by the state of New York, but it only comes in if you're a massive project. I don't know any slate quarry that uh, has to uh, in New York State that has to comply with uh, like reclamation and all of those sorts of things. They that's really the big big operations that have to do that. And I know it was brought out a couple times by a couple witnesses. Uh, in the last hearing that uh, uh, that Vermont's different than New York. Uh, Vermont is much more restrictive than uh, New York for, for four slate quarries. I'm not saying about other operations, but four slate quarries. Unless there's been some change in the leg legislation just recently that I don't know about, that it's, but it's always been that way. So that's all I have to say. I think we're going to have a few questions for you because you can help us understand the New York situation. Representative Squirrel. You said that there was a point at which there's regulation that occurs on the New York side. What What is that? What is it's, that? It's cubic yards. It's it's <clears throat> massive amounts what, of... What's the number? Uh, my recollection is it's somewhere up around a, a million cubic, uh, cubic yards uh, of... A year. Uh, a year to be taking out. It's, 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 it's huge. So you said you're subject to it, but you're not, because your quarry's not that big. I think if we grow to do that, then we would probably have to, we would have to comply. But uh, at, at, at the level that we are and at the level that most quarries in Vermont operate, they wouldn't be. So your quarry in New York is active? It's, once again, it's a reserve quarry. You know, we use it, it's some years we need it, and some years we don't. It's, and I think that's another thing that would be a study group would find, that it's, uh, it's, you don't always work all your quarries all the time. So if you don't have reserves, then you're going to, somewhere down the road, you're going to be in serious, serious problem, and that, that will, re, it will then just, re, Reverber, uh, reverberate in the uh, in your own business and in the number of employees you have and um, the uh, it, it just it, in in the area and I, I think that if uh, if quarries can't keep their reserves they really don't have much of anything and I think it's going to mean massive losses of jobs it's not going to happen overnight but it will because at some point you've got to go back to your reserves representative Morgan is your uh, New York um, quarry near the Vermont border? Uh, yeah, it's it's right. You know, it's within um, a half mile. Mile. What, what town is that? 
It's in uh, gravel. Gravel. Um, I'm, well, I want to follow up a little on that and, and wondering, um, we, we've heard different perspectives on the slate industry in New York right across the border. Can you give us a sense of this, the scope and scale of that industry in New York, on the New York side? Well, once again, I think it's, it's smaller because there's a, the geology is quite different. I've got a geological map back in my office that shows the, how a slate run. It does run over into New York State. It's not nearly as extensive as it is in Vermont. And the, the, uh, the chemical substance of the slate is different uh, slightly, it, and it has different qualities to it. It, it makes much better, uh, uh, for example, a flagstone. And think it doesn't make real, most of it doesn't make real good roofing material. Uh, but it's uh, it, it, there are a few, but almost all the quarries in in, in New York are um, just worked on an ad you know on, on a needed basis you know but that's the way that's the, the the quarry business in general that's you know you 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 don't go to one quarry and work your whole life there you you know you have to work from quarry to quarry to uh, get the what the material that you need for a particular order because. Quite, you know, on a, most roofing slate uh, uh, orders are uh, multicolored and may come from numerous quarries. How much slate does Greenstone extract in a year? How much? I can tell you uh, a rough, rough state uh, dollar wise or squares, uh, square wise. What do you say, John, square wise? Uh, 25,000 squares. About 25,000 squares. But there's no, no correlation to weight. So we, we take out a yeah. What's a square? Square what? A ten by ten area of can coverage. You, what, what is it in cubic yards? Ten by ten. That's area. that's the terminology that's used a lot. In cubic yards. But cubic yards does not apply to us, <clears throat> and unfortunately, you you know you're extracting a stone, and a, I, I I'm John Hill. I run the by our mine and uh, run our office, so. Uh, basically, a cubic yard is something that I um, aggregate would use. We're not aggregate; we're dimensional stone. So, a cubic yard of dimensional stone may be two rocks. You know, make a cubic yard makes nothing because the stone is no good. Otherwise, you can extract the stone, and maybe a ten-foot long stone. It's to a foot thick. Divide that area by a cu uh, one quarter inch. That's how much we have to sell. So it's really quite hard to put a number on. You know, like I can extract, you know, four cubic yards and make a square slate. I may this week I may extract four cubic yards, and make a square <laughs> slate. Next week I can extract 25 and not make a square because the stone changes. So it's really, it, it, we had the, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, officer, uh, you know, hard, um, <coughs> excuse me, we had the Act 250 people come down and see what goes on. And they, they basically, in the 90s, were like, you guys do this? We, uh, you know, we do not, um, we couldn't imagine it. So it's uh, totally foreign to uh, the stone dis industry compared to aggregate. So I'm kind of being short with you, but it's, it's I don't really have an answer. Um, I, we would love to have you come down and show you. Okay, uh, a couple more questions, Representative Fabe and then Squirrel. Do you know of any slate quarry that's been de uh, de depleted? Depleted. Depleted, yes. <laughs> any quarry that's been depleted? Yes. Like done, closed? Closed, um, in other words. <clears throat> Yeah, we have a quarry that we that we think is pretty well pleaded. It's pretty rare, but yes, we have one, and, and we and, and yes. So it's not common in the industry no. to mine it out, so to speak. No, it, it, you know, it, with most of the quarries, with changes in technology and 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 changes in business and so forth, the quarries, you know, you go, a lot of the quarries have been gone back and, and, and worked, yes. And uh, for, I, I mentioned about it in my last testimony, um, my dad bought uh, some land in the 1960s and uh, I bought it from him and uh, 
we've uh, we've been holding it. We know we we think that there's some pretty good slate there, and but we have and we've had other quarries that we could work in, but those quarries are getting worked down. So we are probably going to have to dip into our reserves to to keep going in the future. Representative Squirrel. Yeah, I'm going to come back to this cubic yard <coughs> measurement. Uh, I'm not sure what happens in Vermont, but I know in New York, I think in order to get permits, depending on what the level of extraction is, it's still based on cubic yards. You have to do that measurement to get the permit. I understand your point that the finished product may not be everything you're extracting, but I think from our perspective, it's the total of extraction that's taking place, not necessarily the finished product. Well, okay. that that could that could well be. Well, that was my point too. Is that the um, to open the, the criteria for regulation? The it doesn't apply to small to small quarries. It doesn't would probably never apply to a, a, a slate quarry like you have in Vermont. The amount is huge. Uh, not, unfortunately, I didn't have I didn't have time to look it up or anything. My understanding is in New York, anything over 750 cubic yards per year requires a permit. I think it's a lot more than 750. Well, that's what information I have. So. No, it, like 750 cubic yards is minuscule. That's, that's, yeah, I'll, I'll double check. That's so. the information I have. All right, Representative Dolan and then Warren. Good morning. Uh, my question is about um, the, the byproduct. Mm -hmm. the, the mountains or, or piles, and mm -hmm. interested to know a couple of things, if I may. Uh, one is, what are the barriers to try to manage those that, that byproduct? That is the stone that has been accumulating and piling up. Um, interested to know what the barriers are in terms of crushing or processing or finding another market for that stone product. And then the second question is. Uh, we too are concerned and, and care about the long-term economic viability of the region, both for the quarry industry but also for their communities as well. So reclamation is oftentimes an important element to ensure that the landscape is uh, well managed to, to uh, attract businesses, attract families, and uh, um, help to ensure the vitality of the region. So interested to know, and perhaps this will be a topic of the of the working group, uh, how uh, your perspective is, and how to provide some uh, degree of reclamation to help support the long term viability of the region. So the two questions are, what's what are the barriers on in terms of managing the uh, the stone material that's a byproduct of, of quarrying, and the second is the degree to which. Um, uh, some reclamation will help ensure or support the economic vitality, like your response to that. Well, I think the, the, the uh, uh, to answer your first question, I think the, the barrier is transportation. I don't think there, this is my personal opinion, I don't think that there would be any, uh, and I, you're talking about the, the waste matter, I, if, if we were closer to, uh, Hundred miles closer to a major metropolitan area, I think all that stuff would be gone. I mean, it's all very usable material. Right now, it, it's just not. It's just too expensive to uh, to get it to the to the market. Uh, and you know, it. But we're seeing it uh, the the market grow, and um, there have been some um, there have been some plans to uh, to uh, get. Um, get the crushed stone, you know, to crush it and sell it, and sell it uh, in the major, major areas. The uh, reclamation. I was talking to the. Um, we had we had a site visit by uh, the, the Army Corps of Engineers, and we were talking about reclamation. And of course, they're thinking this stuff out. They haven't thought this out completely. Not, so I don't want to put words in their mouth. But they were saying that these. These holes with these with this water in it are could well be uh, a tremendous asset in the future, and um, they haven't come to any real conclusion of that. But I think they're thinking it over that maybe it's not a good idea to start refilling these these holes uh, um, with uh, with this beautiful fresh water in it. And most of the water is just 
you know, it's pristine. You can drink it. And uh, so I don't know that that um, I don't know that that really uh, answers your question. I don't know that there is a, an answer to your question. I think there's kind of an assumption that maybe it uh, the uh, these slag piles are uh, hurt the area. Um, I, tourist wise, I don't know. One of our biggest draws in the area is the uh, Slate Museum, the Slate Valley Museum, and tours tours around to these old slate companies. I know in Europe, I've been in, in Wales, and they have uh, that's a massive industry over there. Uh, the, the quarries are pretty well worked out in Wales, but they have uh, uh, like they have a lot of these reserves there that are in these old quarries there that they um, and they have. A, 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 a national, it's the, the uh, a, a national museum. We don't get, I, I'm not complaining about Vermont, you know, the Vermont government. But we don't get much help down there. You know, we don't get help as far as museums. We get, you know, I know the towns and everybody do the best they do on the roads. It's not like, I've been to Spain, and in Spain, the government, uh, first of all, I back off to the the deposits of slate in Spain are way to, up in the mountains, up in the northwest corner. And the government of Spain subsidizes roads to those quarries. They subsidize, uh, they subsidize electricity. They put, in, they put in power plants and so forth. They even build a railroad in, into their quarries. And I'm more than, I'm not, I don't think we should expect that, and I'm not you know, saying, but we don't get a lot of help I think there's a lot of help that we could do for our area in the tourist industry using the, the slate assets, this, using the slate history. And if I, I would suggest anybody that's really interested to uh, go down to the uh, Slate Valley Museum. It's in, in New York. All right. Um, we have to wrap up. I'm all set. Um, we my question okay. has and been answered. So one final question, Representative McCullough. Um, th this actually is for, for uh, Craig, and, and um, I didn't, I may have missed, but it, Craig is there a representative here from the town of Pollitt? Yes. 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 So, and, and, and did, did, had they identified themselves yep. as Pollitt? Pollitt. Um, yes, Pollitt. Yeah, yeah, you no, did. No, no. Pollitt. I, I, I meant um, Green Mountain College um, and told me. Yep. 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 Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you all for coming in. Uh, yes. I have the wheat. Um, I'm doing some quick math. So we use, uh, we would attract 45,000 tons. For the record, remind us who you are. I'm Jonathan Hill, the Green Stone Slate. And we are probably the largest uh, producer of uh, you know, roofing slate products. Not not structural, not flooring, just roofing. And that's 45,000 tons a year. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, and then there was one more. Craig, did you have your phone? No. Um, Kurt McCormick was used to be chair of this committee. Can you and say for the record your yeah, name, please? My name is Charles Brown, Brown Corridor Slate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Kurt McCormick uh, chaired this committee years ago, and when they did the last study committee, yeah. and uh, when it passed, when he brought it back, with the Democratic uh, mix they had, they came down and did it all. And when they brought it back and put it together, the to build together, that which we are going under, that the roadmap that they made for us back then, they have voted the passed in the House 147 to 3, and in the Senate 29 to 1, and then Howard Dean, Governor Dean, signed it. So Kurt McCormick, I believe he's still in the House uh, now. I think it would be very uh, good for your committee to bring him in and let him talk to you and uh, explain to everything that they did because that was a 12 to 18 month study that they did. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Thank you. We're moving on to the next item on our agenda, but thank you all so much for coming in. We are shifting gears to S113. Laura gave everybody hard copies yesterday, so hopefully you still have it. And Michael's going to walk us through the bill. We're going to hear from a lot of witnesses this week on this bill, so get ready.
ready. Get on to your seats. Fair warning, I think there's 16 of them already on the list. Shall I begin? Yes. Uh, this is Michael Gray with Ledge Council. I'm going to do a uh, walkthrough of S113. Do you all have the ASPAS version? Uh, yes, we do. ASPAS by Senate. Okay. Um, so this would add a, a new chapter, subchapter of law to um, 10 to say chapter 159, the chapter related to, uh, to waste management in the state. The new chapter would relate to single-use carry-out bags, uh, expanded polystyrene food service products, and single-use plastic straws. The key components of this bill really are the definitions. Um, they effectively set who uh, is subject to the requirements and what is subject to the requirements. The first key definition is carry-out bag. It's a bag provided by a store or food or service establishment to a customer at point of sale, and it's not a pharmacy bag. Um, so a store is later defined on page uh, four as a grocery store, supermarket, convenience store, liquor store, dry cleaner, pharmacy, drug store, or other retail establishment that has over 1,000 square feet of retail space. So the, this this requirement applies to those stores with 1,000 square feet of retail space. And it's my understanding that comes because of a, is that from another state's it, model? The, the other jurisdictions use that threshold, yes. But otherwise it's, I mean, do we know why they chose that? It's basically to draw a line at big versus small. Yeah. Yeah. Just a clarification. So a thousand feet or less, this does not apply. Whenever the the requirements address a store or food service, or a store, it does not apply. Okay. Then the definition of food service establishment is is included, but it just cross references the existing definition in 18 VSA 4301, um, and those are basically entities that prepare, serve, and sell food to the public. So stores, 1,000 feet or more of retail space, and then people who prepare, sell, and food for the public um, are subject to the carry-out bag. And then you get a definition of expanding polystyrene. I'm not going to go through this, but effectively it's styrofoam. That's the brand name um, for what uh, expanded polystyrene is. Then you see what an expanded polystyrene food service product is. Can I just ask, is expanded, the definition of expanded polystyrene also from other states or where did that come from? Uh, it's from Maryland. Um, it's a product made of expanded polystyrene that is used for selling or providing food or beverages and is intended by the manufacturer to be used once for eating or is generally recognized by the public as an item to be discarded after one use. It includes food containers, plates, hot and cold beverage cup trays, cartons for eggs and other food. It does not include food or beverages that have been packaged and expanded polystyrene outside the state before receipt by a food service establishment or store. A product made of expanded polystyrene that is used to package raw, uncooked, or butchered meat, fish, poultry, or food, and non foam polystyrene food service products. Um, we already went through the definition of food service establishment, the definition of plastic. Uh, this is the scientific definition the synthetic material made from linking monomers through chemical reaction to create a polymer chain that can be molded or extruded at high heat into various solid forms. Um, then you get reusable carryout bag. It's a carryout bag that's specifically designed and manufactured for multiple reuse and that is made of cloth or other machine washable fabric that has handles, that is a non-woven polypropylene bag that has handles, that is a durable plastic bag that has handles and at least 2.25 mils thick or made of paper or other material that is not plastic, has handles, and has a thickness of 2.25 mils. So, mil is one one thousandth of an inch, 
Um, and I would like to note that sub D there was added basically in a floor amendment. There might be some issues about whether a paper bag is a reusable bag. <laughs> in other jurisdictions, reusable bag is often defined by the number of uses it has. Uh, for example, up to 125 uses. Um, and so the, the question is, would paper bag really be appropriate um, under the reusable definition? Um, then you get to the definition of single-use paper bag. It's a carryout bag made of paper or other material that is not plastic, that has a thickness of less than 2.25 mils, and that is not a reusable grocery bag. Single-use plastic carryout bag means a carryout bag made of plastic that has a thickness of less than 2.25 mils. And so remember, that's the threshold. If you're under 2.25 mils, that is the threshold for how you are going to be regulated. Then there's the definition of single-use plastic straw, a tube made of plastic that is used to transfer liquid from a container to the mouth of a person drinking the liquid designed and intended to be used only once, generally recognized by the public as an item that is to be discarded after one use. We already went through the definition of store. Then you get to page four, new section 6692. A food, a store or food service establishment shall not provide a single use plastic carryout bag to a customer. Um, so, thousand foot or more retail establishment or somebody providing an entity providing food shall not provide a single use plastic carryout bag so something that's 2.25 mils or less um, and is designed for one use um, and is provided at the point of sale um, and that is the, what the prohibition is on the single use paper carryout bag, a store or food service establishment may provide a single use paper carryout bag at the point of sale if the single use paper carryout bag is provided to the consumer for a charge of not less than five cents per bag. So to stop right there, um, the, this provision is included because there was testimony and some evidence that when jurisdictions ban single-use plastic bags and don't have a fee on paper bags it just shifts consumer choice to those single-use paper bags and therefore doesn't have a significant effect on solid waste reduction um, and it doesn't drive the consumer to use a reusable bag so that's why it's there uh, it was 10 cents as it came out of the Senate Natural Resources Committee. There was a floor amendment to make it five. Many jurisdictions have 10, some have five. Some jurisdictions exempt um, certain individuals, such as people receiving SNAP or WIC. Um, and so there's, there's some consideration there. Um, and then on page four, Sub B, all monies collected by a store or food service establishment um, under this section for provision of a single-use carry-out paper bag shall be retained by the store or food service establishment. So that, that is basically an incentive for the food service establishment to provide these bags um, and to effectively help cover the costs that they would have in providing the bags. Um, people have questioned why and whether you can mandate that they keep the fee. Um, so basically this is a regulatory fee. It's not an administrative fee, a fee to, to pay for the cost of a program. It's a regulatory fee, an incentive or a disincentive fee. Another regulatory fee that you can think of is the wetlands permitting fee. It's a 75 cent per square foot fee. That is not related to the administrative services provided by a and It is in part a disincentive fee, a regulatory fee. This is a regulatory fee and in other jurisdictions, namely California, when this provision was challenged, the courts have said the regulator can delegate who gets to collect the fee and the disposition of that regulatory fee. So that's what you were doing here. 
Yes, Representative Lefebvre. Uh, if I were a retailer and chose not to charge anyone for the for a paper bag upon request, would I be against violating the law? Yes. So I'm I'm obligated under, under this bill now. To well, as it, it has to be a single use paper bag, um, so one that's under 2.25 mils, as this is drafted right now. Wait, the paper thickness is the same as the plastic thickness? Okay. Representative Odie. Um, the last mm -hmm. sentence you said, it's not an administrative fee and the courts have what? The courts have said, <clears throat> namely in California, that when this provision was challenged that the state could delegate an entity to collect that regulatory fee, effectively delegating the responsibility for making them effectively an actor for the state um, and then can direct the disposition of that fee. So. Um, page four, six, six, nine, four, single use plastic straws. Food service establishment shall not sell or provide a single use plastic straw to a customer, except that a food service establishment shall provide a single use plastic straw to a person on request. Should we move on? Do they have the right. we're going to try to later focus on the understanding yep. the bill. Okay. Then in page 46695, this is expanded polystyrene food service products, a person, and you may want to relook at whether it should say a food service establishment or store, um, but a person shall not sell or offer for sale in the state an expanded polystyrene food service product, a store or food service establishment shall not sell or provide food or beverages in an expanded polystyrene food service product. This section shall not prohibit a person from storing or packaging a food or beverage in an expanded polystyrene food service product for distribution out of the state. Why does it say person? Um, you know, uh, the, that question came up um, on the Senate floor, and it really was they wanted that provision about, about sale to be broader than food service establishments or stores. But then it kind of creates a little bit of confusion in the civil penalties provision where it says a person who violates the requirements. And there are questions like, well, if I'm the person that gives out the straw, the, the teenager working in the summer, am I the one that gets the penalty? Um, so I think there could be some clarity either provided to the, the expanded polystyrene provision or the civil penalty provision. So if you want to say a person, you want the, the sale provision for expanded polystyrene to be broad and the penalty for that to be a person, I think you might want to work through some of that language. But otherwise, the requirements are on stores and food service establishments. For the, for the bag thing. For the bags and the straws. Mm -hmm. Representative McCullough. So then person, um, in, in sub C here is not other def, uh, person in other in other arenas means companies. There is no definition of person, so the default, default definition of person would apply from Title One, and it is every pretty much any legal entity you can think of. It's a legal entity mm -hmm. and not a human. No, it is a human. It's any any it, including. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Um, that takes you to uh, page 5, 6696, the civil penalties. The person who violates the requirements shall receive a written warning for a first offense. So first offense is no, um, no violation. Shall be subject to a civil penalty of $25 for a second offense and be subject to a civil penalty of $100 for a third or subsequent offense. And for purposes of enforcement, an offense shall be each day a person is violating the requirement of this chapter. Um, should I move on? Yeah. 
So there's rulemaking authority that A and R would have to adopt rules to implement the requirements of the subchapter. And then you get to section two, but before I get to section two, there are a couple of things that I just want to reference. Um, first, there are a lot of municipalities out there that, that have bag bills as it is. Um, the question of whether or not this should supersede those bag bills was raised. The Senate wants those, those jurisdictional ordinances to, re to remain in effect while this Section 2 working group looks at them and how they work. But you're in that, in, and that was their intent, dated on the floor. But there is some uncertainty about when this goes into effect, Section 1, what happens to all those other municipally administrable ordinances and bylaws. Does this supersede them? Is this a minimum? Can municipalities be more strict? Right now it's unclear, and that's partly because effectively the chair of Senate Natural wanted this working group to look at the different examples out there and see how they work. So you either answer that way, as the Senate did, or you look potentially to clarify um, how this applies to those municipal jurisdictions that have a bylaw or an ordinance regulating the single use carry out that. Okay. Um. There is one other issue that you are going to hear from your colleagues and your constituents. It's going to be about every scenario, about every type of bag, right? It's already started. What about the candy bag? What about the produce bag? What about the dry cleaner bag? Right? Uh, what about the bag that my newspaper is delivered in? actual question because one of the senator was concerned that he wouldn't have the bag to walk his dog with. So it's like there, there you're going to get all of those. The Senate committee's position was that the bag provided at the point of sale, right? At the point of sale, at the register. But they did provide a provision, the exact exemption for a pharmacy bag because, the, you know, when you get your your pharmaceuticals, it's often at the register. And so they wanted to be clear that that bag was not um, subject to this provision. But in other jurisdictions, the exemptions are more specific. Produce bags, dry cleaning bags, there are other examples. So you either take the position that it's at the point of sale, at the register, or you will you may want to look at some more specific exemptions. Thank you. Can I just, what are the rules that are anticipated being needed for this implementation? Um, so, so in those jurisdictions that have, have adopted it, I'm thinking like, well, a similar version like DC, Austin, um, some of the California municipalities. They've, they've found that they've, they need, they've needed to address some specific details about certain types of bags, um, exemptions, things of that nature. Um, and so the rulemaking has been needed in some of the other jurisdictions. Thank you. I'm going to hold. Thank you. Okay, thanks. I have no questions. What about mobile um, gas feed trucks? Uh, the definition of food service establishment includes those. Oh, just check it if, if it would be stationary or mobile. So one of the interesting things about the definition of food service establishment, the statutory definition is not the same as the regulatory definition. Mm -hmm. And so the Department of Health who regulates food service establishments has made some distinctions. Um, and it's, it's largely around those places like grocery stores where you have food sold in bulk, but then you have the sandwich area or fried chicken area or bakery area. And so they've made a distinction where the food is served for immediate consumption, that that's the food service establishment and not the entire, the entire full retail supermarket. Um, 
And so th there, there's distinctions that have been made at a regulatory level about what's the food service establishment and what is not. Does that set us up for inherent conflicts in this bill? Um, no, I, I don't think so. Um, because the way that, that DOH does it, and you could incorporate the DOH regulatory, the rule definition of food service establishment, but I think the way that it's, it's where the food is provided for or immediate consumption or takeaway. Um, and then you get the single-use products working group. Uh, the, the, there are many of the same definitions that were in the, the regulatory sections. The charge begins on page 7. The single-use products working group is created to evaluate current state and municipal policy and requirements for management of unwanted single-use products and to recommend to you the General Assembly policy or requirements that the state should enact to improve statewide management of single-use products. Hold on one second. It took me a second to catch up through the definition, so. Okay. So they're going to uh, recommend to you policy or requirements that the state should enact to improve statewide management of single-use products, divert single-use products from disposable landfills, and prevent contamination of natural resources. There's a whole membership. There's a member of the Senate, a member of the House, Secretary of Natural Resources, a representative of a, of a materials recovery facility in MRF, um, two representatives from solid waste management entities, a representative from VLCT, a representative of an association or group representing manufacturers or distributors of single-use products, a representative of an environmental advocacy group, two representatives of stores or food service establishments. Then you'll see the powers and duties of the group. We'll evaluate the success of existing state and municipal requirements for management of single-use products. They'll evaluate the availability and utility of compostable single-use products. They'll estimate the cost to the state of municipalities of management of unwanted single-use products. They'll estimate other costs of management or failure to manage unwanted single-use products. They'll summarize the effects on the environment and natural resources, the failure to manage them properly. They'll recommend methods or mechanisms for improving the life cycle management of single-use products, including whether the state should establish extended producer responsibility requirements for manufacturers, distributors, or brand owners. And then page 10, if extended producer responsibility for single-use products are recommended. And that's a typo. It should be subdivision 6, not subdivision 5. The single-use products to be included under the requirements of financial incentive for manufacturers, distributors, owners, et cetera, of single-use products to minimize environmental impacts. How to structure requirements for manufacturers, distributors, or brand owners to provide for or finance the collection of the single-use products including using the existing infrastructure um, for collection, processing, and recycling of products, and an estimate of the cost and benefits of any recommended method or mechanism. The working group gets the uh, administrative, technical, financial, and legal assistance of A&R, the Department of Health, the Office of Legislative Council, and Joint Fiscal Office. <coughs> On or before December 1, 2019, they submit their report to you, the General Assembly, putting their findings and recommendations. They have to call their first meeting on or before July 1, 2019. Um, the group exists until February 1, 2020. People get compensation, including legislators, for participation. Does it say who the chair would be? No, it didn't. It says the committee shall select a chair from among its members. So then you get to the effective dates. Uh, the working group takes effect on passage because it has to meet before July 1, 2019. And the single use products provisions take effect July 1, 2020. So you get the working group report back next year before all the single use provisions go into effect. You can amend the single-use provisions and or address how it supersedes or affects municipal 
bylaws and ordinances at that time. Um, it, it, it appears that the five cents on a paper bag seems a small and detriment or disincentive to encourage the um, use of um, a reusable bag. Did, was, when when uh, the Senate took up this issue of 10 cents and then, and then ended up on the floor, amendment except the five cents. Was there any discussion about that? And yes. Uh, the, the, the basically the discussion was um, whether the fee was high enough to incent a change in behavior or whether the fee was too high for those that um, could not afford it. Um, and so there was concern that 10 cents was too high for low-income individuals um, and that it should be changed to reflect that and that's that's the position that won on the floor. And did they ever, if I may follow up, um, did they ever discuss if it were to be at that level, should they make it just optional versus mandatory? Um, I mean, in, in committee, when reviewing the proposed amendment, there were members of that committee that didn't want to make the change um, and said that without it being 10 cents, there potentially should not be a fee at all. Um, but not, not to make the five cents discretionary. I'm curious about the 2.25 cents and why not just ban all single-use point-of-sale plastic bags? How did they get to that number? Uh, it's the threshold that's used in other states. I'm looking at California right now, <coughs> statewide, 2.25 million. Yeah. Is there an easy example of that line in the sand? Um, there, I, I don't have it with me, but there's, a, a, um, there's like a gauge document mm -hmm. that shows like this is what what this your typical bag is this is your next size and i can i can get you that um to give you we might be incentivizing thicker bags it's your incentivizing reusable bags yeah. yes yeah. and the question becomes and and that this is a question that's arisen in other jurisdictions whether or not um certain bags really are single use but they they exceed the 2.25 mils i can't remember which town in massachusetts it was that set it at at like five mil um, to, to disincent that kind of trying to manipulate the the mill threshold but at the same time you're not going to be able to find a bag that's not a reusable bag um, that's more than 2.25 mil. There not, aren't that many people that manufacture that type of bag. Manufacture what type that of bag? Type of bag that type of bag, that's greater than 2.25, and that is not a reusable bag. Oh, it is not a reusable. So they manufacture. <laughs> Go <laughs> ahead, Representative McCullough. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Dyslexia, Batman. You'll, you'll hear from all the interested yeah, parties know. about whether or not that's the appropriate threshold. Yeah, of course we will. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Representative Bates and then Odie. So page 7, number 10. Um, I am totally lost on what single-use disposable plastic food service wear is. And uh, yeah, that and printed materials. What I thought... Isn't this just for bags, straws, and polystyrene? The, not the first section is. That's the the regulations, the prohibitions. The second section is a working group, and they're going to be looking at a broader universe of single-use products, ah. and they're going to recommend to the General Assembly potential policy or requirements. And so there are jurisdictions that do regulate the, the single-use food service wear, uh, forks, knives, right. bowls, etc. Um, 
And then printed material is a significant component of the, of the recycling stream. And so, and there's not, after National Sword in China, there's not a lot of options for management of it. And Kathy Jameson's here, she can talk to you more about that. Um, and so one of the purposes of this working group is to look at those types of products and recommend ways that, that they can be better managed to avoid their environmental and other issues. Thank you. Representative Bodie. So I'm looking at um, page four line, it's under 6694, and it includes service establishment that shall provide a single-use plastic straw to a person upon request. Well, did you hear, did, did they say it was added to plastic? Why, why, and we're requiring for all eternity until this law changes, plastic straws being made. So is it that some people have to have plastic for their disability, or? The, the original language was if, a, to a person upon request, if they have a medical condition or disability. And, and in other jurisdictions, and the general conversation around that is, A, yes, some people do because of their, of their condition or need a straw, and that a metal straw is not inappropriate, and um, they may not have a reusable straw with them. Uh, and so a plastic bendable straw is the best accommodation for certain persons. And that if you have the criteria being based on the fact that the person has a medical condition or a disability, you basically put the onus on both the retailer and food, the food service establishment, I should say, to determine do I have to make a judgment, does this person have a medical disability, or you put the onus on the person requesting it to prove they have a medical disability. And, and that, that is not proper accommodation um, in either instance. And so th that, that is the kind of the debate there. And then you have other considerations. Um, in some jurisdictions, you can get it a straw upon request for but only for the number of beverages that you purchased. And so you may have seen this in Tampa. They had something like this, and a guy came up and, and bought a beverage, and he got a straw, and he wanted another straw, and the, the person wouldn't give it to him. And so they got into a fist fight about it at the cash register, about whether or not he could have a second straw. Um, and so th th there, there's different ways that, that jurisdictions have looked at that issue, but to the best way to, according to the Senate, to accommodate the persons with conditions and to avoid the putting the onus on either the food service establishment or the person with the request is to just say that it's provided upon request. I get that provided upon request, but mm -hmm. why does it have to be plastic? Why can't it be a straw provided you, upon you, you, you could do that. Um, you might get some testimony that, that that it has to be a straw that is appropriate to accommodate the, the person. We can pursue that, Carol. It's, All right. it's a great question. Other questions? Thank you, Michael. All right, committee. We have more breaks if people could come back on time better. So we have seven minutes. You have to be back by 10.30. Yay. <laughs> Before you say. <laughs> Talk to the chair. Hey, that's just like, you yeah, yeah, have to do that. Did she have a Westford? Yeah. No, no, no. We are going to call our meeting to order. Jameson. Well, well, come on forward. Sure. Couple of members still walking in. Welcome. 
Thank you for having me. For the record, I'm Kathy Jamison. I'm the Solid Waste Program Manager at ANR. And uh, thank you for um, uh, allowing me to come and testify on S113. Um, so I'd like to start off by saying the administration's position on this bill is neutral, but I'm here today to share with you some background information and factual information about um, plastic bags specifically, um, single-use plastics in general, and the recycling markets um, and, and where that might be heading. Um, so if I may start with um, single-use plastic bags and um, you see that in S113 that targeting and would ban um, the use of the single-use plastic bags and you might say, you know, why? How did we get there? And that originally um, many countries and, and then counties and cities within the United States targeted single-use plastic bags originally as a, a litter issue and then a marine litter issue specifically, or aquatic, where it was getting on beaches, it was unsightly, it was clogging um, storm drains, and they took actions, you know, originally for that. Plastics, though, and single-use plastics, and you'll hear testimony this week about single-use plastics, how uh, we are becoming um, more knowledgeable about their potential ecosystem impacts, um, people are targeting single-use plastics because of a resource issue, the amount of plastic waste that's generated, and how we can try to you know, conserve our resources and reduce greenhouse gas emissions by maybe making different choices with respect to single-use items. You hear a lot of discussion about um, the resources and what's called a life cycle analysis, and I'd like to share just a little bit of information about that, if I may. Um, and so. Um, those analyses look at environmental impact of a product from the beginning of, of gathering up the inputs to manufacturing that product to the, um, you know, the, produce, the production of the product, the use of the product, and then, and then the proper management when the consumer is done with the product. And so they call that the, the over the life of the product. And um, with respect to bags, um, single-use bags take up more resources compared to a durable bag when the durable bag is used repeatedly. So if you just used each bag once, like a single-use bag once, and a durable bag just once, then the single bag would win because it's, it's thinner, a lot less material and whatnot. But with the use and reuse of durable bags, and they are produced, um, and manufacturers so that they are stronger and can be used repeatedly, then the durable bag wins. So you'll hear some, some trade-off there and, and discussion about that. Um, the one important thing, and if you only remember one thing from my testimony, is going to be this, okay? Yeah, listen. Um, that these life cycle analyses only look at the impacts from proper management at the end of life of these materials. What you're going to hear and why many um, counties, cities, and countries have taken an action is these single-use products are not being properly managed at their end of their life. So they are getting into the environment. They are causing problems with um, aquatic wildlife and, and, and potentially even getting into our food chain. All of those negative environmental impacts when they're improperly managed are not part of the traditional life cycle analysis. And so that's why um, we are seeing many government entities taking action on single-use products. Um, so you'll also hear that it costs a lot environmentally to produce a paper bag. Why are we not, you know, why are we treating paper bags separately than plastic bags? And it is true that it does take um, energy to produce a paper bag. But they're very different um, products, and, and they're made out of different materials. So plastic bags definitely contribute to visible litter, litter, and they don't degrade easily. You know, if a paper bag is out to the environment, within a few days it's going to degrade, and eventually it could be something that could grow plants. With, paper, with plastic, we're finding that you know, it breaks down into smaller and smaller and smaller pieces, but it's still plastic. It's not something that can be readily used for plants and animals. In fact, they're finding that these little, little small pieces of plastics 
are being consumed by aquatic life um, and, and becoming part, you know, ingested and not being able to be properly um, digested. So um, plastic bags have been found to um, disrupt um, the natural environment and man-made drainage systems. Um, they pose risks for wildlife. Um, everyone last year probably saw the picture of the turtle with the straw. You know, so, so these plastic items are causing impacts. Um, even with our, um, in Vermont, uh, single-use plastic bags causes, they cause problem in our, our, our waste stream management. If it goes to the landfill, you know, when the truckload of trash goes in the landfill, it gets, you know, put into a large, um, basically hole in the landfill. If there are plastic bags that are loose, they can blow away. The landfills are required to have fencing all the way around the perimeter of the landfill. And they have staff that, at, you know, weekly or more frequently have to go around picking up any debris that um, is blown away from where they're trying to keep it contained. So, you know, so it's a problem at the landfill when it gets disposed. If plastic bags should never go in your blue bin for recycling. If you want to recycle a plastic bag, please take it to a retail store that has a, um, a place or a container where you can put it. If it goes into the blue bin, it goes to the MRF, uh, the Materials um, Re uh, Recovery Facility. We have one in Williston, another one in Rutland. If it goes there, it gets tangled up into the equipment. The system has to be shut down, and all the plastic film that's in there has to be cut out by an individual. So CSWD um, informed us in 2017, it took them 780 staff hours that year to clean film off MRF equipment. So, um, and it's a dangerous job to get in there and, and cut that out. So, so it is causing issues in our recycling system and our disposal system and our environment. Um, the one interesting thing is, um, even though we think we, we, and we do use a lot of plastic bags, they are small and they only take up a small part of our waste. <coughs> um, so they take up about 1% or less of our waste stream. We know that from our waste composition study. EPA does um, information or shares information nationally about materials that are managed, and they report that only about 5% of plastic bags manufactured are being recycled. So we don't have great recovery for recycling these materials. They're either getting disposed in the landfill or getting out into the environment. Um, so that's kind of background on, on why um, these bans are happening in other places. Where is it happening? Um, there's at least 65 countries throughout the world that have adopted plastic bag bans. Um, and there are more than 375 U.S. counties and municipalities that have enacted legislation. They either charge um, fees on the bags or ban on the bags. Uh, California was the first statewide um, program that was um, adopted, I think, about a year and a half ago. And more recently, just I think last month, New York passed a statewide legislation on banning plastic bags. California uh, program, they require a 10 cent fee on paper bags um, that the retailer um, provides the customer if the customer doesn't bring a reusable bag. Um, New York's a little bit different. Um, my understanding is that it's up to the county to decide whether or not they pass um, an ordinance that would require a charge of five cents um, at the retail level. Um, one of the things I am hearing from folks is that um, the reason why there's more support this year for a statewide program is they want a consistent program throughout the state. And so I think, you know, keeping it at the state line wide level has some benefits rather than kind of letting different counties or municipal entities do things differently. Um, there's been attempts to try to do this voluntarily and um, California was a really good um, example of that where many or multiple attempts at either a, a city or a county level was made. They didn't see any significant progress and that prompted um, about 130 cities and counties in California to adopt mandatory programs. And then that led to California adopting a statewide program. Um, 
with um, with programs that are out there, um, they have demonstrated to be very effective, at not only reducing the number of um, single-use bags that people use, um, but also to have um, positive environmental impact impacts. Um, with uh, San Jose, California, they were having a, a significant problem with storm drains, and they measured after implementation of their program an 89% decrease and having to go and unplug uh, or remove um, the, the, the plastics from the storm drains. And then Montgomery um, County, Maryland demonstrated or documented a, a significant reduction in their litter. I think it's a 55% reduction in litter once they, uh, their plastic bag ban went into effect. Um, there are three different types of models that are typically used with these mandatory programs. Um, one model is to just ban the bag. Um, some entities ban just single-use plastic bags. A few have banned both plastics and paper. Um, some um, municipal entities or counties or countries just charge a fee for the bags. They don't ban it, uh, but the bag can be available upon a fee. Um, some elect to do that only for the plastic bags. Some elect to do it for both um, the plastic and the paper. However, the most common model that's out there is what we call the hybrid model. And that's where um, they ban the plastic bag and charge a fee on the paper bag. The reason why that's done is it incentivizes, that fee will incentivize the consumer to bring their reusable bag. But having a bag available when the consumer either forgets their um, uh, reusable bag or perhaps they're a tourist and on vacation and they you know kind of left that habit at home it provides an easy low-cost effective um, solution um, that's um, a paper product that is easily recyclable um, that doesn't have necessarily the negative environmental impacts that a, paper, a plastic bag has um, Studies have shown that um, when people have to pay, even just a little bit, kind of incentivizes behavior. Um, you might remember a few years ago, um, there were some grocery stores that uh, if you brought your own bag, you get two cents off your, and they kind of phase that out. Um, studies have shown that when you get a little bit of money back, it doesn't necessarily prompt you, but if you charge that same amount of money, that you'll change your behavior. And don't ask me to explain why that is. <laughs> um, so so, um, so that's what's kind of out there. The range in fees um, that are typically charged um, for the paper bag, they range from five cents to 25 cents, but the two most common charges are the five cents and the 10 cents. Um, when California had all of those you know, 130 counties, municipalities, adopting um, ordinances, it was by and large, um, 10 cents was the most common charge that they had. If you took California out of the equation, and if you looked at all the other counties and in, in cities in um, the U.S., I have to kind of look, look at my cheat sheet on this one. Um, I think there's, okay, so there's 25 um, in, the, in the United States that charge 5 cents, and there's 11 that charge 10 cents and then there's five that have like different numbers, like 17, 25, two, and eight. But you know, so so you can see there that either five or ten is the most commonly used. Ten was really common in California. Five's a little bit more common in other places other than California. Um, if you want us to do a little bit more research on that, we can uh, to pull numbers up. We did have someone kind of looking at different programs and trying to track. Them. Okay, we have a, are you finished? Um, I do have some information about recycling and a little bit on um, um, polystyrene. Let's let her finish. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, um, so um, with respect to um, polystyrene, I don't have as much information to share, but that is not easily recycled. And um, just to, to know a little bit more <coughs> about what, why, it, why can something be recycled is you have to be able to collect enough of it in a manner that's um, reusable in the marketplace and ship it to a place that is willing to use it. And what 
polystyrene, it is really, really hard because of the life. I mean, the, the strength of polystyrene is that it's light, but the disadvantage of it, it's hard to collect enough of it to then be able to efficiently ship it to somewhere where it can be used, and it has to be clean. And so, um, so you'll hear from people um, perhaps this week that that will, you know, tell you that right now in Vermont we don't have the ability to easily recycle polystyrene. Um, and then a few minutes on the on the recycling markets, if I may. And so, um, so what um, Michael Grady alluded to is that there has been a drastic change in the markets that started in the beginning of 2018, where China changed their importation policy on recyclables. You know, with um, recyclables, um, we uh, have been accustomed to single stream recycling, and sometimes other materials gets in in the recyclables, and off, oftentimes too, with the processing, a little bit of like glass can get in the paper bale, a little bit of paper can get in the glass container, um, and so there is what we call contamination. And and China had been receiving our recyclables, our U.S. recyclables. Uh, for a long time and, and um, manufacturing products and then shipping those products back to us. And they um, took a strict um, policy that they were going to, one, they wanted to try to develop their own recycling within China to feed their manufacturing. They also wanted to be able to take better, higher quality feedstocks for their manufacturing, and so they raised the bar. And so that has flooded our U.S. market with our own recyclables, and when you flood the market, then the price drops. And so, with respect to Vermont, that had the most impact on our paper, what we call our mixed paper recyclables, um, because that's what we were shipping to China. So the cost of managing um, mixed paper has, um, has, has gone up. Um, and nationally, we recognize what we need to do, and this is not likely to change in China. So we need to, to change how we're looking at these materials, and this is happening in Europe too, is to, can we have materials manufactured such that they're easier to recycle, that they provide better materials and feedstocks for inputs for manufacturing. In fact, the European Union is ahead of us on this. They've adopted what's called the circular economy, where they are working directly with manufacturers so that once the consumer is done with it, it can really feed into manufacturing um, a, a new product. That makes, you know, it reduces waste up front. Um, it makes recyclables more valuable and it creates, creates less expensive feedstocks for manufacturing. Um, and so we need to invest in our recycling infrastructure, not only in Vermont, but nationally. But it's challenging right now because the value of our recyclable commodities are at a low point. This is occurring at the same time packaging is changing. And so what we're trying to manage is changing. And it's becoming more and more harder to recycle materials being used in the marketplace. And so the, 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 the two of those um, challenges are prompting other states to really look at how should we change the system. And there are at least three states right now, Washington, Connecticut, and Indiana, who are looking at, looking toward using a model of extended producer responsibility. And we use that model for managing several of our, our, our waste types, material types in Vermont, including electronics, paint, batteries, mercury added products, um, and those have been demonstrated to be very successful programs in Vermont, um, the ones we have implemented. And so that's going on, and that's why you are seeing in the second section of S113, the study group looking at that broader group of single screen plastics, and the need, you know, should we look at, explore whether or not Vermont should pursue extended producer responsibility. So. Okay, we have time for a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. Representative McCullough. Um, two questions. Um, Kathy, when, when um, what what states or, or jurisdictions are you aware of that that um, give a pass on the purchase at the point of sale for a single use um, paper bag when when the customer has a snapper wick? Um, I think that is uh, okay. California and, and New York are the only states that have statewide programs, and it's in the California law. And, 
the New York law, I haven't read all the way through okay. yet, um, and I don't know if it's in the New York law. Okay, second question, um, you, you said 5% um, um, of, of the single-use plastic bags are recycled based on, on your actual counts um, going through, um, and we understand that's an estimate. I'm wondering how pervasive in that 5% dry cleaner bags are. Um, so the 5% number I get from EPA, so I don't know okay. the answer to that. Um, I will say that um, it is common for dry cleaning bags to be exempt from um, other jurisdictions that have put bans on plastic bags, mm -hmm. um, as well as um, the produce bags. And if you're mm -hmm. in a hardware store and you get the little oh, yeah. bits of nuts and bolts and you put them in a bag. Yeah, yeah. So it's common for those types of bags to be exempted. It, that, that absolutely understood, but when when maybe that's a better question for, for CSWD because they're the ones that actually are pulling right. through. They there. see what's coming through. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I will ask. Mm -hmm. Okay. Representative Fave, uh, give us a little more on what the high, high, how the hybrid uh, system works. Where you know I'm. I'm I like the idea of banning plastic bags just upright and then going with, if you needed a bag, having a paper bag available. But I'm just wondering, is that is that the way they, they work the hybrid or not? Um, the hybrid, yes, that the paper is the bag that's available, that the plastic gets banned, mm -hmm. not vice versa. Um, and then, and then there's a charge, a fee on that paper bag, and that's to incentivize the consumer to bring in the reusable bag. Um, you know, um, Chicago has a seven cent fee on bags, and I vis my son lives there, and I visited him, and we needed to go to the store, and he, he keeps bags right on his fridge, and including a couple of really big paper bags that he reuses, because <laughs> he said, Mom, it's seven cents. And so, you know, that, that fee incentivizes him, because he paid seven cents for that paper bag, so he's going to reuse it. <laughs> Thank you. Kathy, thank you so much. That was yeah. incredibly helpful. Thank you. Um, next up, we have Paul Burns. Morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, for the record, my name is Paul Burns. I'm the executive director of the Vermont Public Interest Research Group, VPIRG. Thank you. Yeah. And BPIRG, um, as you may know, is the largest consumer and environmental advocacy organization in Vermont with about 50,000 members um, across the state. And we have long worked, we were created in 1972 um, and working on solid waste issues and recycling has been uh, kind of um, uh, in our uh, domain since the earliest days when we were supporting the bottle bill which was also uh, launched in 1972 here in Vermont and um, so we have a, a long history on these issues and I uh, therefore really appreciate the opportunity to be uh, before you today. Um, I have submitted testimony as you see here and um, some written, uh, some printed copies for, for some folks uh, as well. There are um, more than a dozen citations in here, so there's lots more reading if you all are interested as, uh, as we go through um, uh, the testimony here, or I'm not going to uh, just read every line here, but we'll be referencing some of these other things um, as well. Uh, but um, simply put, we organizationally are very supportive of this legislation that you're considering. Um, it takes on what some people call the trifecta of uh, single-use plastics, that being uh, the uh, single-use plastic bags, straws, and polystyrene. And uh, so it's an, it's an excellent start um, at addressing this problem of plastics. I'll note that I also made available to you all as members of the committee this National Geographic uh, magazine edition from June of last year. Um, and I, I note it now because they've got the plastic bag uh, featured here um, uh, in the um, look of an iceberg because this 
when we talk about dealing with plastic bags and straws and polystyrene, it really is the tip of the, uh, the iceberg when we're talking about plastics overall. So uh, lots of excellent information, some of which I will refer to specifically in that uh, edition. Um, this is an issue that um, it happens to be something that I've worked on personally for a long time as well. Um, it happens that uh, 29 years ago this past February, I was uh, standing in front of a Wegmans grocery store in Syracuse, New York, protesting their plastic bag policy and Wegmans uh, kicked me off their property um, along with others who were protesting this. So there's a nice photo of me, Representative, I know you'll appreciate that. Um, thank you very much, um, I appreciate that. So 29 years uh, we've been working on this policy and uh, on Monday of this week, Wegmans announced their plan to eliminate plastic bags by the end of this year only takes three decades sometimes to uh, win these policies. Wegmans uh, announced this policy in New York State, and as you just heard from Kathy Jamison, New York State did pass legislation just a, a, a quite a month ago to eliminate uh, plastic bags uh, by March of next year. So Wegmans is getting a little bit of a jump on that by eliminating them first in their New York stores before that. But I was happy to see that as kind of my, uh, my own personal involvement. Um, I'm sure that had something to do with it. Um, <laughs> so um, it, we are hearing an awful lot about the problems of plastic, whether it's this uh, National Geographic or 60 Minutes did an episode on it uh, uh, six or eight weeks ago, and you know it's just in the in the news an awful lot about the problems of uh, of plastics that we're seeing. And I note that you know even Wegman's in their their statement, which. Um, you see there, they, they talk about not, not only are uh, they uh, reusable bags, the best option for the environment, but they also hold more groceries without breaking or tearing, requiring fewer bags per shopping trip than paper or plastic bags. That marks real progress um, when it comes to Wegmans. And just below that, you see a description from the National Geographic magazine of the scope of the problem more broadly. According to National Geographic, the world has created about 9.2 billion tons of plastic since um, around 1950, just after World War II. 9.2 billion tons. Most of that plastic, 6.9 billion tons, has become waste. And of that, 6.3 billion tons never made it to the recycling bin. What that means is it either ended up in a landfill or an incinerator or out in the environment somewhere. Um, again, as Kathy Jamison was talking about, a lot of this material doesn't end up being properly dealt with at the end of its useful life. And we're talking about single-use plastics, as is the subject of this bill before you. We're talking about items that usually have a useful life of about 15 minutes or sometimes less. And then they last in our environment for 500 years or more. Um, and that's why it really makes sense, it seems to me, for you to be focusing on this, this problem as you are. Uh, these kinds of plastics are choking our oceans and spoiling our environment, killing wildlife. Um, and if that weren't enough, we must also recognize that these plastics are threatening our health as well. Um, you have heard that plastics don't break down in the environment. Uh, they, are not, uh, they, don't, they don't exist in nature. Microplastics then are uh, found all over the world. And just as some examples, I pulled some recent headlines about where these tiny, tiny bits of plastic are now being found. Uh, you may have seen some of these yourself, but there's a story from The Guardian about sea salt around the world is contaminated by plastic, studies show. So if you've got some sea salt at home, you're also pouring little bits of plastic um, on your food. Plastic fiber is found in tap water around the world. So you say, okay, maybe I'll use bottled water. The World Health Organization wants a health review after microplastics were found in 90% of bottled water supplies. So it's not just in tap water and bottled water as well, which of course you know a lot of bottled water, sorry, uh, comes uh, from, some, from a tap someplace. Um, the, and, and, uh, Milwaukee Journal Sentinel um, found that studies find tiny bits of plastic in beer samples, including that in Milwaukee. I don't know that Vermont beer has been tested specifically, but don't think you're safe there. And finally, from, from National Public Radio, beer, drinking water, and fish, tiny plastic is everywhere. So it's in our food, it's in our water. We cannot avoid being exposed to these microplastics. 
So I wanted to show you a couple of graphs, and these were some of the sources of uh, some of the information that you will also see uh, very similar on, uh, I think it's page 55 of the National Geographic magazine, but you'll see uh, much of the same data contained here. The top graph um, is looking at global primary plastics production. This is the production of plastics from about the, the beginning, 1950 or so, to 2015. And uh, it is broken down by industry sector. And you're seeing a, sh a pretty sharp incline in the quantity of plastics being produced from uh, beginning um, in 1950. There uh, we had uh, uh, about 2 million metric tons of plastic resin being uh, created uh, in 1950. Then you see a pretty, um, a pretty regular incline there. You see in 1973 there is a dip from the oil crisis. Um, and then in 2008, uh, the Great Recession, another significant dip. But other than that, from an environmental perspective, it's a remarkable and concerning upward trend in just the overall quantity of plastics being produced. This next graph shows the quantity <laughs> of uh, plastics waste generation. And the kind of interesting thing in here is it, it largely mirrors the top graph of plastics production, but there's an even greater quantity of waste when you look at the type of material, type of, uh, of use, and that is in packaging. Packaging accounts for uh, just about half of all of the plastics waste that we're seeing being generated today. And when you hear, I believe it was uh, Senator Bray talking about the fact that in the last 15 years or so, that's half of all plastics ever made was made in the last 15 years. That means you just look at the line from, in this graph, 2000 to 2015, and you see that how large a chunk of the overall plastic production that is. That's how it outweighs all the rest of the years combined. All right, so I probably don't need to spend a lot more time on the problem. There's more information and testimony, and you, you have lots more access to that. So let me get to why we think S113 is a good idea, a good solution uh, to get at some of these most common types of throwaway plastic. Uh, first, the bags, the issue of bags. Um, and you have heard about what the, what the policy is. Um, we support the policy. Uh, but I do urge the committee to consider returning to a 10 cent charge on paper bags. And there are a couple of reasons for this. The first is that a 10 cent charge on paper bags is just a more effective incentive to encourage shoppers to bring their own reusable bags to the store. Um, uh, Wegmans noted uh, that that's a transition that needs to happen. And there are lots of other places with, with a very good experience that we can look to. In California, for instance, though their statewide law hasn't been in effect all that long, um, at the city and county level, there has been a lot of policies in place for enough time to be evaluated. Uh, consider, for instance, in Alameda County. Um, in Alameda County, this uh, second to the last paragraph, you, you see in 2013, the county passed a, an ordinance similar to the provisions that we have in 113 with respect to bags. According to the analysis from the agency that oversees solid waste ma management in Alameda County, the 69 chain stores there went from using 50 million uh, bags each year down to 10 million total between paper and plastic. That would be a heavier duty uh, plastic um, and paper that people would be paying 10 cents for there. That's a tremendous reduction. Uh, the number of bags overall went from 13 to 8 million uh, uh, in terms of paper bags and then plastic, 37 million down to 2 million. And so this, what's interesting there is I think it demonstrates how well it can work to put a 10 cent charge on paper bags, because you might have expected that there would be a much uh, more common just transition over to using paper bags, which are still available to everyone, but at that 10 cent charge. So people decided not to pay the 10 cents or larger, you know, there are fewer people using paper bags in this county now than there were before the law uh, to begin with, even though the plastic, uh, single use plastic bags are not available to them. So what is happening is that people are bringing reusable bags at a much higher rate and when they buy one or two items, the study finds, they leave the store without any bag at all if they didn't bring their own. Um, and so that is working really well. Uh, and the senior program manager there identified the 10 cent charge as being key. Her quote is, 10 cent charge really affects how consumers behave at the point of sale. Just quickly to note uh, some of the other information from other California communities. Um, 
it, there were 151 cities and counties that adopted a single-use bag ban ordinance before the statewide law went into effect in California. According to the group Californians Against Waste, there are lots of information. If you uh, care to look for more, I've got the citation here, but several three, three points really uh, rose to the top. They eliminated over five billion plastic shopping bags. These are all the counties and cities uh, taken together there in California. Five billion plastic shopping bags per year. Uh, and all the resulting litter and waste equaling 66 million pounds of plastic. Reduced paper bag consumption by nearly 40, 400 million bags annually. And then there is a climate benefit as well as they reduce by approximately 185,000 metric tons of uh, carbon dioxide emissions per year. It's a lot of benefit when you think about these policies just dealing one kind of one bag at a time there so it's a fair question with these exemptions and so forth and it was raised the other day does it you know does it still work california much bigger than vermont but you know you can still bring it down to scale and we're going to see a significant environmental benefit by adopting this policy um, by increasing the charge to 10 cents it would also allow the state to use a portion of that money to get more reusable bags into the hands of the people who really need them. In the Senate, as you've heard, there was concern about the 10 cent charge on paper bags and the, and the hardship that that may pose to some Vermonters. But it seems to me the best answer to that concern is not to lower the charge on single-use paper bags to a nickel. Instead, we should make more, um, uh, we should make reusable bags, which are far more durable and versatile more easily accessible to everyone. And so you could use a portion of that extra five cents that if you were to add it back in to perhaps um, ha have a grant program at the Department of Environmental Conservation where they could work with nonprofits, um, with food banks, with community action agencies or others who have regular contact with folks, uh, maybe lower income Vermonters who, who if they don't have uh, access to reusable bags now, we could get them into their hands. Everything that leaves the food bank could go in a reusable uh, bag, for instance. And after a couple of years, I think we will have saturated the market enough here so that few people could say they don't have ready access to one or perhaps multiple reusable bags. Um, but they are available now. I. You know, I brought some. Everybody's got these things. We've got dozens now, but they last a long time. This is one that VPIRG put out in 2002. Still works really well. Um, and there are lots of other examples, but I wanted to bring one from California. When I was out in California a couple of years ago in a place that already had the, uh, the policy in place, you see how small that they can scrunch down and then you can have these nylon bags. And this is a grocery store that was very proud of it um, where they talked about a Grove Market, uh, they were voted the best neighborhood market there, and uh, they had a nice little recycling symbol and talk about how great this is, and it's uh, greenbagamerica.com, you know, so it a, becomes a marketing tool for some of them as well, so, yes? I just want to be sure, we have three other witnesses before lunch, so I want to make sure you get to your high points that you want us to go away with. Absolutely. So let me move, thank you, uh, so I would say consider that move to increasing the charge on the paper bags, which is our probably number one recommendation for you to consider in terms of a change here. And how, if you want to talk more about how we could make that work to get more reusable bags out there, I'd be happy to do that. Really the second change uh, that we would uh, suggest from the Senate proposal has to do with the area of the straws. And that is exactly what Representative Odie was raising earlier. Um, there is a, a section of that bill in section 6694, which is page four of the legislation that talks about how establishments shall uh, make a single-use plastic straw available upon request. Um, and it seems to me that uh, you may want to, instead of using the word shall, use the word may. And the point there is that um, establishments uh, must not be prevented from making straws available to people who request them. Um, and that, was, that's, that would be a legitimate concern. Um, but since the establishments are not required to make a straw available today, it would be an unusual thing if, with the passage of this bill, for the first time, establishments would be required to make a plastic single-use straw available to anybody who asks for it. Um, so you could say they may make a plastic straw available, or perhaps even better, you could say they will make a straw available upon request. And there are lots of examples of straws uh, that are out there now. And I'm just thinking about establishments that make the transition, as many already have, to paper straws or something else. Uh, it would seem unusual, again, if they had to stock uh, plastic straws for anybody um, who asked at that time. 
there, um, there are no changes that we propose with respect to the polystyrene um, provisions here. Uh, it's a ban that makes a lot of sense. I will point out that as part of testimony, we have um, offered um, a decision out of the state of New York, um, New York City, that had to do with um, uh, a proposal there dealing with a restriction on polystyrene. And it goes through very methodically why it is that, that it is um, an appropriate policy to eliminate polystyrene for these kind of food service uh, containers. And there, that is in the testimony that I'm offering you here. I won't go through it, but the two major points are it is more toxic than any other kind of plastic. It is not effectively recyclable at all. And if you leave it in the system, it can make other items in the recycling stream, it, the material recovery facility, contaminated because it is so light and it crushes and separates so easily that if you're doing paper recycling in the same facility, a lot of it gets contaminated with this polystyrene. And it really makes uh, a great deal of sense to take it out of the system entirely up front, um, as much of it as you can. We support the idea of the working group. Um, and uh, I think it's a, a terrific idea as we look at next steps. Uh, extended producer responsibility is part of that. You're seeing a lot of uh, makers of packaging and even beverage makers now talking about a higher degree of recycled content in their beverage containers. Coca-Cola announced in Australia that by the end of this year, 70% of their beverage, uh, plastic beverage containers will be made of 100% recycled content plastic. But in the U.S., their plan is only to get to 50% recycled uh, content by the year 2030. Uh, it seems to me we could do, it's not a technological problem then, it is a problem of a lack of commitment to do it here, so it may take states uh, like ours and others to give them uh, a push in the right direction. It's 70 percent where? In Australia. And 50 percent here. Well, 70 percent of, uh, there's a couple of numbers here, 70 percent of their bottles will be made of 100 percent recycled content. So they're saying they can do 100 percent, they just won't get to all of them. Uh -huh. Here it would only be 50 percent recycled content. Oh by the year 2030. So, um, so I, uh, there's so much uh, more that can be done there, but we, this is a terrific first step, the elements contained in 113. I think the working group is, uh, just makes a, an awful lot of sense as we think about next steps uh, for doing that. And if you're gonna have more recycled content, you gotta look for clean quality material, particularly PET plastic. And for that, we would encourage you to be considering um, an update to the bottle bill as well. Uh, and that is some of the recommendations um, that you find in my testimony as well from plastics experts uh, out there. If we're never gonna get to that level of recycled content without clean recycled uh, plastic material. So the Thank you. The number three on your list of requests, return to 10 cent paper bag, straws, the language you propose, and then your last thing is update the um, bottle bill. Yes, but not as part of this. I would love it if you felt uh, so inclined, uh, Madam Chair, but uh, I've got another place. I have an idea for that for you. But, it, but it's kind of an example of, I think, what this committee could be looking at as well. I really appreciate the opportunity to testify before Sure, you and I want to make sure if there's any questions that we have a chance. Anyone have questions? Representative McCullough. Um, for, the, for, the, for California, let's just say California, do they ex exempt um, WIC and PETA um, no. from, the, from the requirement? They do not. No. Thank you. Uh, in the New York, uh, if, I, if I may, the, the, the New York law, in terms of the five cent charge for paper bags, it's not a statewide charge. What they, that legislation, I don't think anybody would talk about it as a good model, uh, but they allow cities and counties to put a charge on paper bags of five cents, and then they split the five cents, couple of cents uh, going to the kind of programs I'm talking about for getting reusable bags into the into the marketplace, and then uh, several cents going to a state uh, uh, environment fund. Representative Dolan and Odie. Well, just a quick question. Good morning. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your opinion if we're, we're also struggling about trying to find uh, sources of funding for clean water? And if we move this to 10 cents and retained five cents of it for clean water funding, what's your, do you have a reaction to that? Well, there's a nexus between uh, single-use plastics and single-use products generally and, and water, you know, and water protection. So I think it makes sense. And even if you were to initially use some of this money to get more reusable bags out there, you could, after a year or two, transition over so that all of that went to clean water would be a perfectly sensible place for that. Or you could, I mean, it's 
it's up to you and your colleagues to make that decision. But I think there is a nexus between clean water and um, and and this idea of um, single use uh, items. Uh, it is also true that the, uh, the bottle bill now has the unclaimed deposits going to uh, clean water, and so any expansion there would expand the amount of money going to clean water, too. Thank you. Representative Odie. That was exactly my question. Oh, great. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Paul. Thanks very much. <laughs> great mind. Yeah. <laughs> After us. All right, John King. Secure the garbage can. In my presentation. <clears throat> I'll start out with the note that there, there are three of you get done before. Yeah, the, I, I'm going to do an expedited uh, uh, process uh, and try to try to make it as easy as possible. Okay. My name is John King. I work for Foley Distributing, uh, Vermont's last remaining Vermont-based non-foods distributor. Uh, we sell over $1.25 million worth of retail paper bags, retail plastic bags, paper hot cups, expanded phone cups and products, and compulsible packaging products. So we provide a neutral position <coughs> that's uh, 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 neutral and, and, and transparent. Um, we do not support Bill S-113. Uh, we believe the most sustainable thing to do is have a no bag ban, which means no paper bags, and no plastic bags. Uh, the gentleman before me uh, kindly noted Wegmans. And um, I always look at good things for, for companies um, when they start using things. Uh, but if you look at uh, uh, future of grocery business, uh, artificial intelligence is going to be a key. In five years, there won't be any cashiers, and you're going to be able to put your food into a, into a carriage, and you're going to walk your food right out to uh, the car. That's within five years, if not sooner. Walmart, by the end of this year, will have robotic scrubbers cleaning all their floors and all their stores. There's robotic scrubbers to do the uh, scanning of all the, all the, um, uh, the retail shelving. Okay, so that's coming down. The, there's a book that I recommend you read. AI superpowers, and it'll tell you what's going to happen in a lot of the different segments. Um, I'm going to break this down to two categories, plastic bags. Um, this is the high D bag, the most cost effective. It costs about a penny or two, two pennies. That goes in the trash right now, side of the roads, lakes, and things like that. Um, this uh, is a low density bag, primarily used like at city market. Um, and it's, um, it's about 0.8 mil thick. Um, it is reusable, heavy in the handle, and um, this goes in the trash, okay? Um, this is a reusable bag, and a lot of the laws that have been passed, like in Massachusetts, and I think this bill recommends is a waiver for 2.25 mil, okay? So, uh, this is an option for some of those customers that have a lot of walking customers that they're using it. Um, okay, so on this one here, this is about seven cents. So one to two cents to seven, seven cents. This is about 12 to 13 cents, 2.2 mil. And on this bag it says, um, um, can be used 125 times. I don't know who said that. I don't know what tests were done, um, but uh, I know what this bag looks like after a couple of times, and, and uh, it says it can be washed. Uh, I, I recommend all of you go get one and try to wash it and see how it goes. Um, so that is what I'm concerned about, is if you look at uh, the plastic industry, they're predicting the more use of plastics, because people that do use bags and get a waiver 2.25 mil is going to be more weight uh, when you're a plastic manufacturer, you don't look at bags, you look at weight, that's, that's dollars. I was at Mike's Donuts, uh, Mike's uh, Pastry in the north end of Boston that enacted this, uh, this law, and I bought five cannolis, and I got a 2.5 clear bag and, and for five cannolis. Uh, that's an example <laughs> of, of what's going on. You can't make this stuff up. So th this, is, this is, so again, Did you get one? If you look at uh, what is the most common car that's going to be made, uh, it's going to be trucks, pickup trucks, 
Everybody's driving a pickup truck. If you look at GM and Ford in the last three months, they're going to be producing pickup trucks. What goes in the back of a pickup truck? Bags. Bags. Okay, that, that goes on that. <laughs> like Champlain. We're going to be going fishing for a day. You're going to have this heavy duty. Where, where does the plastic bag go? It's going to go in the water. So um, I think generally people are, are good. I think they're not intentionally throwing these things away. Um, but that's when you enact this law at 2.25, you're going to be selling more plastics and they're going to be uh, still going in the same spot. Um, here's another example of a 2.25. This is heavy duty, okay? Um, paper bags, okay? Uh, we've been doing Hunger Mountain for many, many years. We ask a lot of a paper bag. I recommend you all go to Trader Joe's and see what Trader Joe does. So uh, they're California based. <laughs> they're double bagging a handle bag. Uh, and uh, so I don't know uh, those stats when you double bag every time that's that's a lot of bags sustainability when you measure how much it costs environmentally to make a paper bag it's not a really clean process it takes a lot of energy a paper bag machine is 75 feet long 23 feet wide it weighs about 25 tons it's huge it takes a lot of energy not one bag paper bag manufacturer is certified I sell toilet paper and towels to the state of Vermont. All our products are certified, which means they're Green Seal certified or Eco Health certified. They have to get audited in these plants to make sure they have the best standards. Find me one paper bag company that has been certified. You're not going to find that. And then, uh, most importantly, someone had talked about life cycle and the disruption of recycling. We just can't make this up. We've been sending all our stuff to China for all these years, and it makes absolutely zero sense. And all of a sudden, for security reasons, China says, we're not taking your stuff anymore. <clears throat> so all of a sudden, we're getting flooded with all this material. And um, if you look at recycling, and we've developed a closed loop recycling called uh, P3 closed loop, and, and you can certainly look at it. We have it at uh, Champlain. We basically take shredded paper, and we bring it to a mill uh, very close by, and we sell the product back. That is recycling. Okay, so you look at this paper bag, it's really a single use bag. It, it's, it's not going to be used twice. You can't even use it once, it's so hard. So, because a lot of times it, 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 there's moisture in it, there's no moisture to rips. So, a lot of people are not using that twice. This goes in the recycling bin because it says it's recycled. But if you look at what's happening in the state of Vermont, we have a waiver right now to July 2019 that all the mixed paper comes as a single stream can go into the, into, the, into the landfill, okay? And the question that should be asked is, where is the mill going to be to take this? You know, before the newspaper print mills closed in Canada, that's where we used to send our stuff. Then we sent it to China. The question is, where is this going to go? Is it clean enough? I deal with manufacturers, uh, the few that are remaining in the New England area, and they can't take a lot of this stuff. So, this basically goes in the trash, okay? So uh, that takes care of the, the paper side. And currently, Costco, BJ, and Sam's do not provide any bags. I recommend you go and visit that so you can see that yourself. Um, <clears throat> that's going to be the future of all these other retailers, except for small mom and pop stores. That's an issue that needs to be addressed. And. Uh, this, this bag <clears throat> is a reusable bag, I think. It's polypropylene. It's made in Vietnam. It's got canvas handles. 50 cents. Um, I got this at Hannaford's, and uh, he charged me 50 cents. And uh, the general manager was at the cashier. And now it's a million dollar store a week, and the general manager is at the cashier. And I asked him what's going on. He goes, I can't get any help. And, and uh, he says, listen, I'm going to give you two bags. He said, in five years, there's not going to be any cashiers. You're going to be putting the stuff in the cart and go right to your car. That's where it's going. That's from the general manager telling me what's going to happen. So this is a reusable bag. Um, it can be cleaned very easily. It's more storable and more durable. Um, or, or like the bag that uh, the other gentleman uh, had shown you. So um, we're just talking about you know, if you measure it, you can manage it. If we develop this, this law and, and nothing's really ever happening and we're doing more plastics and we don't have the data, uh, we're just saying things to say it's really good. And I think that's something that should be considered. Do the due diligence 
and, 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 um, and to do that in. Expanded polystyrene products. Uh, again, we sell uh, compostable packaging. So I'm going to give this really, this is compostable packaging. Most of this product is made in Asia. And uh, when it's compostable, it's got to be certified by BPI. And it's got to be made with um, uh, corn-based PLA product to allow it to break down in certain conditions. Currently, there's only one place in New England and New York that can technically take all commercial packaging for composting. And it's a great star for Vermont. It's Green Mountain Compost. They can take this and they can compost it. <clears throat> Everywhere else, Boston, is, is not a place to take it because uh, it's massive volume. <clears throat> New York City, you know, I don't know where they're going to ship it because <clears throat> when you make a composting facility, it's a tough place to be living next to, especially the high rent district. So that hasn't been resolved. So, so uh, basically, uh, most of the, uh, I would say 97% of all composting packaging is not getting composted. So composting is going in the trash. What is BPI? Uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a certification like green seal, certifica green seal certification for the paper side and cleaning chemicals. They go in and they've got to meet. They got to audit the process to ensure that they're meeting that they, it breaks down in a commercial grade a composting facility. Green Mountain Compost has done a great job there in meeting those standards and stuff like that. So um, cups, which is a big, big issue, more so than the straws. The straw gets a lot of attention. So we've talked about composting. This is the uh, uh, polystyrene uh, foam. And uh, very light, it's uh, great heat, keeps the heat of product really hot. You look at coffee, you look at any store in Vermont, the number one most profitable category in every store is coffee. So it's important for the sustainability. And when you're selling coffee, heat is really important, especially in larger sizes. So um, what's great about this product, it's a good price point, it's a great heat insulator, and it can be recycled it, it, with the right systems. Um, in place. It doesn't go well with single stream. It just doesn't go well with machines. Um, and um, we're experiencing a lot of issues um, <clears throat> price-wise when people move from this category, all right, to these categories I'll be talking about, it, 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 it you just don't go overnight and open up a new machine. If you look at Dunkin' Donuts, they're going to be moving to double, double wrapped paper by 2020. Um, this company is going to be doing it. So there's a lot of stress. I'm having a hard time getting product because they're gearing up to these national accounts to be moving over. So um, we don't recommend um, at this point. It goes in the trash, um, and uh, that's where it goes right now, basically. Um, so when people, when you ban this, and your Dunkin' Donuts or your McDonald's. They, they know the number. They, when they sell larger cups, it's about the heat and keeping the quality really warm. So the solution is, and you can't make this up, a double paper wall cup. So if you look at the sustainability, it takes a lot more energy and effort to, to make this paper cup. So it's not only one paper cup, it's two. It takes three times longer to make, right? And inside every paper cup, there's a um, a petroleum-based lining in there that's impregnated into the paper, which means it is not recyclable ever. There's some people saying they can. It's just cost-effectively unfeasible. So what has, has to happen, this can't go in your single stream. This goes in the trash. All the paper goes in the trash, just where the foam is. Now, when you're going into landfills, if you look at Vermont, we only have one landfill. A lot of this paper is three to four times the weight of foam. Again, same paper, single wall. The problem here, you, it's good for smaller sizes. Again, polyline. It's it's no different, really, just a different format than the foam. Okay, and that goes in the trash. Okay. Is it? Any, any You're running out of time. <laughs> is that a, right? A uh, You're talking <laughs> trash. <please>. Yeah. <laughs> what? No, I'm not, I'm, it, it's, it's just going in there. So, um, so um, basically, um, I'm proposing it should be no bag ban. I mean, no bags, and, and other than a reusable bag. 
that is the right answer. In five years, it will be here. Okay. Um, and um, polystyrene take home message. What's that? What's your polystyrene take home message? Well, it's it's um, it's this. It's no different than the paper stuff. It's all going in the trash. The trash weighs more. It creates more uh, more uh, uh, um, uh, gases and things like that because of the weight. Yeah. So you're right. opposed to the polystyrene. I, I'm opposed yeah. because if you look at the micro roasters, I sell all the micro roasters that are printed cups. Okay, it's important to when you sell coffee, you need to have a printed cup to promote that brand. Uh, we started with Green Mom Coffee when they had the little coffee roasters. I, it's so difficult to do a printed cup right now uh, because of the pressure. Because when people leave uh, polystyrene to a paper cup, uh, these little micro roasters, I can't print their name on it. I've been to places where they're putting stamps on. So it, it's becoming cost prohibitive because of the pressure going over. Um, so, and it's not recyclable. A paper cup, you know, is not recyclable. Uh, so it goes in the same place as the foam. Uh, in terms of making it carbon, carbon product, it takes the same, it actually can take, when you do a double paper wall from a foam, you're doubling the input there. All right, are there um, questions for Mr. King? Representative Tarantino. Uh, I'm from Rutland. Um, yeah. How many employees does Foley have? Uh, we have 35, 35 employees. Uh, celebrating 141 years this year with Mott's oldest family owned business. I know. So the Senate 113, is that going to hurt your company? Or? It's hurting us now. It's yeah. hurting us now. I can't, um, I, I showed you the Hunger Mountain uh, bags. Uh, <clears throat> there's so much pressure on these qualities of the bags because uh, when California uh, eliminates plastic bags, everybody goes to paper. Well, you know, you just can't turn these machines on, and then, you know, when they're a monopoly, and there's only one really viable paper bag manufacturer, you know, uh, when I, uh, you know, when they have quality issues, they're like, no, we can't help you out, you know, because I mean, they're having them everywhere. Um, so so we, we're eating money on one of our customers, so it is affecting our business. Yeah. I, it's affecting my business because I can't do printed cups for uh, thriving new micro-roasters. Micro-roasters is no different to the micro-breweries. It's really thriving. But, um, you know, when you, um, you know, so it is affecting our business now. And I'm just saying, I'm just posing questions. If in five years you look at this technology, you know, Wegmans is doing the right thing, but they know a lot more than what we know in this room. And they see that that cashier uh, segment going away and there's not going to be any bags. You look at Costco, you look at BJ's, you look at Sam's, they don't have bags right now. And that's where they're all going to go. And so my question, you enact, you enact this law, and in five years it's gone, and really, you're not really doing anything. That's my only question. I'm just posing a question, you know, you know, where's our recycling going? The paper bag is, you know, where is it going to go? Um, you know, and it should be in one sentence. Our paper, all our mixed paper goes to this mill. One sentence. That's all we ask. Where's it going? All right. Thank you very yep. much for coming in. Thank you. Great. Great. Thank you. Honor to appear before you this morning. Thanks, great. I'm Judith Hank. Um, I'm a visiting professor at Bennington College, and I teach classes on plastic pollution. And before coming to Bennington, I served as EPA regional administrator during the Obama administration for EPA Region Two, which sadly did not include Vermont. Um, and I'm here with one of my students, Louise Selt, who is going to join me in reviewing some of this information. So I think, you know, you, you, you've run through some of the important issues, but the one statistic that really um, sticks with me is that if we don't really change the way we do single-use plastic packaging in the world, by 2025, for every three pounds of fish in the ocean, there will be one pound of plastic. 
and 8.8 million tons of plastic enter our ocean every year. And it's not coming from boats, it's 80% is land sourced. So it's litter coming off of the street, it's litter that gets at beaches. And if you look at something like a plastic bottle, not to pick on you, Representative, but if you take a plastic bottle and if it gets into the ocean, the ocean currents and the, and the sunlight will serve almost like a paper shredder. And this bottle will become hundreds of pieces of plastic that then becomes available in the marine environment. The United Nations tells us that over 663 species have been impacted by plastic pollution. That's a photo of an albatross, if you look real closely. These birds are eating plastic, and their guts are being filled with plastic. Uh, the seabirds often think that the colorful bottle caps on plastic bottles are shrimp. They bring it back to the nest. They feed the chicks. The chicks will often choke on the plastic. And if they don't choke, um, seabirds and lots of other marine life is just eating a lot of plastic. And then they feel that they're full. And they're not getting calories from regular food. And they are very much damaged. It seems like almost every week there's uh, a media report about a whale, for instance, was just found with 88 pounds of plastic in its stomach. Um, and those are, those are um, regular reports. I think one misconception with plastic is the gyrus or the, um, the, um, the islands of plastic in the ocean. In fact, most of the plastic falls to the bottom. Only about 5% is on the surface and it breaks into small pieces. This is not just an ocean issue, although you know you may be asking, why does this matter in Vermont? Well, all rivers lead to the ocean, but also our lakes are loaded with microplastics. Um, in Lake Champlain, there was a recent study that the plastics are passing through sewage treatment plants, which by the way, the microplastic may appear in the sludge from the sewage treatment plants. The SUNY Plattsburgh study found 10,000 to 15,000 microplastics being discharged every day from sewage treatment plants in the Lake Champlain Basin. And these microplastics are being ingested by fish and wildlife. There are also a, a chemical exposure issue because um, uh, some toxins such as PCBs and, and heavy metals are almost like hitchhikers. They attach to the microplastics and then they can be consumed. Uh, similar information throughout the Great Lakes. Plastics are made from chemicals and fossil fuels. So your work to reduce single-use plastic packaging in Vermont is a climate change strategy. For many years, plastics were made from oil, but most recently they're made from ethane, which is a byproduct of fracking. So if you look at this uh, diagram of fracking, which is not to scale, but if you look at the flare, that's ethane. And what companies are doing are trying to capture the ethane, send it by pipeline to new facilities called ethylene cracker plants. And at these ethylene cracker plants, where the ethane is heated at high temperature, it becomes uh, a major ingredient for single-use plastic packaging. So the cost of single-use plastic packaging will come way down, but it's not good news for people living near ethylene cracker plants. There are over 250 proposed in the United States, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, uh, the Gulf states, and it, some folks are saying this is the new coal, and again, we'll be relying on fracking uh, to drive more production of single-use plastic packaging. It's very much an environmental justice issue. These ethylene cracker facilities are proposed uh, almost always in low-income communities and communities of color. Plastic packaging has lots of toxic additives, so it's not just um, a solid waste issue, it's not just a water quality issue, it's a toxics issue. 
And when you think about your own life for a moment, if you're like me, you get a very mediocre sandwich for lunch. Uh, it's overpriced, and you eat it in 10 minutes. And what's left behind? The plastic bag it came in, uh, perhaps a polystyrene container, a plastic straw, uh, plastic condiment containers, a plastic water bottle. All of that plastic stays with us for centuries for a very mediocre 15 minute lunch. Um, there, plastic is also a health concern. Uh, I know your body has done a lot of work on PFOA. I've done a lot of work on PFOA in Hoosick Falls when I was at EPA. Um, Vermont, by the way, is doing a much better job on PFOA than other states. But you may be surprised to know that PFOA is used as a lining in food packaging because it's grease resistant. So that's why I never eat microwavable popcorn. <laughs> And as Paul Burns mentioned, microplastics are in our drinking water, in fresh water sources, but also twice as much in bottled water. Now when I teach my class on plastic pollution at Bennington College, I, I notice a lot of the students, like Louie, who you'll hear from in a moment, um, are thinking, well, we can recycle our way out of this problem. And then when I tell them, no, we can't, they look very sad. And I'm very sad, because I'm a big booster of recycling. I love it. But uh, worldwide, we've only recycled 9% of plastics. And that number will be going down. So the bill you are considering, um, I, I call the plastic trifecta. And it's terrific. And you will be one of the first states in the country to tackle all three of this material in one bill. California has addressed all of this, but in multiple bills, and never all at once. So at this point, I want to turn it over to Louis Selt, who will talk to you a little bit about um, bags. Thank you, Judith. Um, I won't take up too much time, but I just want to briefly talk about uh, the section of this bill that focuses on the single-use plastic bags, um, the banning of those and the fee on paper. Um, so I think it's different to consider the multiple factors that this affects in the environment. So not just the plastics that end up in the marine um, ecosystems uh, affecting marine wildlife and ending up in all of our water and in the, that effect. But in 2014, approximately 100 billion single-use plastic shopping bags were used just in the US. And 12 million barrels of oil were used to make that many shopping bags. So the two types of uh, plastics that are used to make plastic bags, the high density and the low density polyethylene, um, in container form, when these are thick plastics, these are some of the most recyclable plastics that are out there. But the film versions that are used to produce single use plastic bags cannot be recycled easily at all. And so these oftentimes will end up being recycled in curbside recycling bins and they end up going to a materials recovery facility, or commonly referred to as MRFs, MRFs. And when these end up in MRFs, plastic bags very commonly jam up the MRFs and cause the equipment to shut down for hours or even days, costing these uh, facilities um, time and money. Um, the proper recycling of these, these thin film plastic bags is very difficult. Um, it requires a completely separate and distinct recovery program, and the public education for the, how this program works has not been adequate. So there's really no easy way to recycle out of this problem, like Judith mentioned. Only 5.5% 5 5 .5 of plastic bags have been recycled. So this is not a problem that we can recycle out of. Reduction is the key goal here. So the fee on paper that is proposed in uh, section 6693 of Senate Bill 113 is really essential to encourage the use of reusable bags um, and not just a shift to paper bags as we heard other people mention. In Brattleboro, Vermont, where they passed just a straight ban on plastic bags without a fee on paper, one of the major retail stores there said that 85% of customers just switched from plastic to paper and that is not what we want to encourage. We want to encourage a shift to reusables. Just shifting to paper creates a hardship on business owners, on small business owners especially, because paper bags are more expensive um, to purchase than the plastic bags. 
So having a fee on paper is really beneficial for the store owners. And in in section uh, subsection B of section 6693 of Senate Bill 113, it mentions, uh, it clarifies that this money stays with the store owners. And I we highly support that and encourage that. So 345 local governments around the country have put a ban or a fee on plastic, with you know California passing the statewide and New York more recently. I myself um, am part of a local group in Bennington, Vermont, um, a local chapter of 350.org, which is an environmental group there. Um, for the last year, we've been working on trying to get a local bag ban and a fee on paper in Vermont. Um, right now, we're putting that operation on hold to support Senate Bill 113 and to really put all our efforts into getting this bill passed. We think having this standard across the state would make it easier for everyone involved and really addressing not just bags, but the plastic trifecta that Judith mentioned. Um, for these reasons and more, I think it's very reasonable for Vermont to follow along um, and ban single-use plastic bags and put a fee on paper bags. Um, we fully support this bill and think it's absolutely going in the right direction for environmental sustainability. So I'll pass it back to Judith. Thanks. So turning to straws, it's always in the top 10 items found during beach cleanups. Um, so I, I think a straws upon request policy makes sense. Uh, we certainly don't, I, I'm curious about what Paul Burns said. We don't want to tell stores that they have to offer plastic straws if they don't currently, uh, but I think you can, you can work through that issue. I think the most important provision in this bill is actually the polystyrene ban, and let me explain why. Polystyrene is made from the chemical styrene, which is a probable human carcinogen. We've known this for decades, and we um, are very concerned about styrene leaching into food and beverages. For instance, if you have a hot cup of tea in a polystyrene or styrofoam cup, that's a problem. You're going to get some of the styrene leaching into your tea. So um, we know that polystyrene is not biodegradable. It lasts in landfills or on the side of the road for over 500 years, and it absolutely is not recyclable. Uh, and I, I really want to emphasize this point. In a laboratory, you can, but in real life, there are not viable uh, polystyrene recycling programs. So as I consult with local governments around the country who are considering polystyrene bans, uh, representatives of the manufacturers say don't ban it, recycle it, but even when the recycling operations are heavily subsidized by the polystyrene industry, they don't last, and that is all outlined in a state Supreme Court decision uh, from New York City where there now is a polystyrene ban fully in effect in New York City, a city of 8 million people, but it was long fought because the manufacturers kept saying you can recycle it and ultimately the, the court looked very closely at that and concluded that is not the case. Um, it's also banned in Albany County, it's banned in the state of California, from a toxics perspective, you absolutely have to keep this in the bill. And also, you know how brittle polystyrene is. So one container gets on the side of the road and it breaks into many, many uh, different pieces. Um, I think your bill is a reasonable and modest approach. The European Union recently banned 10 different single-use plastic items, effective 2021. They've banned uh, plastic cutlery, plates, straws, drink stirrers, sticks for balloons, and which maybe is a European thing, I don't see a lot of <laughs> sticks for balloons, um, and plastic Q-tips. You know, when you buy a Q-tip, it could be cardboard or it could be plastic. Well, believe it or not, they're showing up in litter. And then the really hard thing is how do we deal with cigarette butts? If you look at a cigarette, the filter you may think is, is cotton, it's plastic. And um, that is a major litter problem. It's kind of the last thing people feel that it's okay to litter. Um, and those, um, those filters go down storm drains, 
they go out into the water and the filter will break down into many, many different pieces of plastic. They are not cotton. And on climate change, you know, the United Nations tells us we have 12 years to tackle climate change before we experience catastrophic impacts of climate change. I would argue many parts of the world are already experiencing catastrophic impacts from climate change. Uh, when I was at EPA, um, Hurricane Sandy hit, devastated parts of New York and New Jersey. You had Irene after Maria hit. Uh, the governor of the U.S. Virgin Islands called me. I was since left EPA, but I was asked to come down and deal with some of the environmental impacts of Hurricane Maria. Places in the world like the Caribbean are simply not going to be able to handle more and more hurricanes and more and more intense weather. So while you may be motivated by reducing litter, by cleaning our treasured water bodies, you should also think of this bill, S-113, as an important opportunity to address climate change. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there questions for Judith or Louie? Representative McCullough? Um, microplastics. Is that a different class than microbeads? Yeah, microplastics are basically little pieces of plastic that are five millimeters okay. or less. It's like a grain of sand. That yeah. think of that size. And then microbeads are different, yeah. including you know they're they yeah. until President Obama signed a national law on microbeads, they were purposefully added yeah. to personal care products. Yeah. yeah. And, and and cigarette filters is that? primarily polystyrene? It's not polystyrene. I don't know exactly the okay. type of, but I know, I know it's not polystyrene. Okay, thank you. Is there a uh, simply, could we get a copy of your presentation? This was helpful, but you had some statistics. Yes. <coughs> Both your presentations were helpful for us to fully I'd understand. I'd be happy that. to send it to you. Great. Sorry, I was at a hearing late last night in the Hudson Valley. A Representative Bates. First, I want to thank you for coming down or coming up here from Bennington. It's great. Are you guys the organization that goes to our select board meetings and talk about your know, plastic bags and stuff? Yeah, like? yeah. I've joined them just about six months ago, like okay. the of last term. Yeah. It's quite interesting when I hear you guys talk. So, but anyway, thank you for He's coming. He's really smart. You should just listen to him and the other <laughs> Bennington students. And we also launched a project at Bennington College called Beyond Plastics. Uh, dedicated to reducing single-use plastic packaging nationwide and we are a technical resource we're on social media our website will be up next month and happy to be a resource and I, I think your advisory committee also makes good sense if once you pass this important proposal let's keep going on extended producer responsibility the circular economy a lot of good information out of the European Union and we're happy to be a technical resource for that body. Do you have thoughts on the previous um, witness who said that 2.2 mil, I mean, it would just cause increased use of thicker bags? Yeah, you know, um, I think he made a good point, and I think you have two ways to address this. Go to 4 mil um, or just ban single-use plastic bags altogether and do not state a thickness. Uh, and then have a requirement that it be re the bag be reused at least 125 times. There are some communities um, in the U.S. Virgin Islands, for instance, some of the supermarkets just went for thicker single-use plastic bags, and that that's even worse. So I think the other witness made a really good point. Uh, mo most of the laws are either four mil or silent. I also like his point that you could just ban bags altogether. I wouldn't object to that. So California's four mil? <clears throat> yes. So what we got, I mean, we asked our legislative council, 2.25 came from New Jersey or Maryland? Maryland. 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 Yeah. But, so, but, but the other states don't have statewide, so are these bills that are in process, do you know? New Jersey is, is a bill, not a law. California is a law, and then New York, just banned plastic bags in the state budget, and they did no mill. They just said no plastic bags. At point of sale. At point of sale. In New York. In New York. Um, and that's what California has? 
No, I think California is four mil, but I will double check that for you. I like the way New York did it, because then you don't kind of compete for thicker and thicker plastic bags. Um, although the, um, that reusable orange one, um, it is, it's looking helpful. for the trash can. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He threw that one out. We, you know, I spared you. My, my <laughs> we'd, we'd already had it. But let me re let me reach for one. I think um, you don't want to ban these. You know, these are actually made from recycled plastic. But what you you I think you can um, have a requirement that it be reused at least 125 times yeah. and. You can either go to four mil or just silent on the thickness. And it, it, what's so crazy is, you know, Louie mentioned how many <coughs> local bag laws. 345. 345, they're, they're not consistent. And that's why you need a state law. Uh, most of the laws are local. Um, and everyone's recreating the wheel. We're also learning as we go along. Uh, but I think a smart statewide law makes a lot of sense. Thank okay. you very much. Yeah, sure. Um, and Kathy Jameson, I looked at, you know your head when the previous witness said something about our paper recycling waiver. Would you oh. clarify that for us? So last year, at the end of the session, there was a um, provision put into statute that would authorize the agency to allow the disposal of mixed paper. Remember, that was the one that we were having a hard time market. If there were no markets for it. We have received no requests in the past year, and that sunsets this June 30th. So we never used the waiver. We never used the waiver. The mixed paper is not being thrown away, but it is at a cost that it is being sent to another facility to be you know, to be recycled into other materials. Okay. Thank you for clarifying. Thank you. Go on. What, where you, just, do you have a question for the witnesses? Yeah, just a clarification to try to um, address your point of not wanting to inadvertently ban that recycled plastic bag. So just trying to figure out that language if we try to be silent on the size of plastic and just ban, ban plastic. You could be silent on the thickness and say all bags sold in Vermont need to be reusable. You know, I, we, we'll work on the definition, but essentially reusable at least 125 times. That's going to knock out all of your single-use plastic bags, but I think preserve the reusable bags, even if they're made from plastic. Mm. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, committee, I just want to make sure everyone is aware that uh, the newest version of S96 is available in hard copy. Laura's going to hand it out right now. We also have Michael O'Grady for after the floor to go through that bill with us and um, move into hopefully final markup, the so possible vote. All right, we're adjourned.